Well, typically I record these podcasts as audio only. I actually prefer to do it that way. I do have a face for radio after all. However, I really thought that I needed to do today's podcast on video because my subject is about apostles and whether or not they exist today. And this is a topic that's a bit nuanced. Yeah, I'm going to be using some quotes and text from the Bible. Um, I'm going to be referencing various scholars and so on. And I just think it will be easier to follow if I'm able to put all these things up on the screen. And so if you're one of those that normally listens to the podcast on one of the audio only platforms, you might want to switch over to my YouTube channel for this particular podcast so you'll get the full visual experience. And while I'm on the subject, I would like to go ahead and encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. I really believe that this podcast and all of the other content that I publish there will enrich your life and at the very least give you an abundant source of interesting stuff to think about. Let's dive in. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Daniel Kalenda, and as promised in the previous podcast, I'm going to be talking today about the subject of whether or not the apostolic gift continues or if it ceased in the first century. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time with preliminary remarks today because we have a lot of content to get to. However, I do think that I should just take a moment and mention what brought us to this discussion because otherwise it might seem a bit random. So if you listen to my previous podcast called What is the NAR and Am I a Part of It? I discussed what has become known as the New Apostolic Reformation, which when you boil it all down, it basically amounts to a sort of Illuminati-type conspiracy theory that was started by the secular liberal media to demonize Republican candidates who were associating with charismatic and Pentecostal ministers around the time of the 2008 presidential election in the U.S. And so in order to do this, they basically drew on some terminology coined by a preacher named Peter Wagner. They conflated a number of other unrelated theological issues like post-millennialism, Seven Mountains teaching, and some standard charismatic and Pentecostal theology. And then they combined all of this with what they saw as fringe political positions, like those that were being represented by what was known at the time as the Tea Party. So, for example, some of the things that they saw as fringe political views were things like a preference for small government and opposition to abortion and traditional family values and things like that. And so later on, this conspiracy theory was adopted by heresy hunting evangelicals who then took it a step further and tried to use it to paint charismatics and Pentecostals not only as heretical and unorthodox, as they'd always been doing, but now they could characterize us as dangerous and nefarious as well. Now, I'm not going to open up that can of worms again in this episode, but let me just reiterate this. This NAR thing is basically a conspiracy theory, and its origins are the liberal media. These people hate conservatives. They hate Judeo-Christian values. In many cases, they're not objective journalists. They're spin doctors. They are often activists pushing an agenda that I'd be willing to guess that most of my listeners would be very opposed to. And so just remember, you evangelical heresy hunters listening, these are not your friends. In fact, you have more in common with the most radical charismatic than you have with these people. They would attack you, they would demonize you in a heartbeat the same way that they've done to us. And that's exactly what they did with this whole NAR thing. They slandered charismatic and Pentecostal leaders. They made them out to be a bunch of crazy, cultic, religious zealots who were a political threat. And they did that in order to discredit the Republican candidates associating with them. Now, after the 2008 election, this subject of the NAR was basically dropped by the liberal media. Because once the elections were over, it had no more purpose. And I don't think anyone would have ever heard about the NAR again if it weren't for those evangelical heresy hunters who saw a golden opportunity. And not only did they fail to defend their Christian, charismatic, and Pentecostal brothers and sisters who were being treated very unfairly, Instead, they jumped on the bandwagon. They eagerly took over all of those liberal media talking points, no matter if they were true or not. There was no concern for whether there was a shred of integrity in the reporting or a shred of truth to the accusations. They just gobbled up all the vomit. They made it their own. And then they used those secular liberal journalistic hit pieces as proof of their wild accusations. And then, you know, over time, they just built out this NAR conspiracy theory to such a ridiculous degree that anything and everything that they disagree with theologically is just painted with this broad brush called the NAR. And anything that's particularly strange or weird that goes on somewhere in the charismatic world is automatically identified with the NAR. So they've sort of 
consolidated all of their acrimony and indignation into a single straw man effigy that they just flog endlessly. Now, I laid all of this out pretty thoroughly in that podcast that I did before. So if this is something that you're interested in, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. I'll put a link in the description of this podcast. But before we completely move on, I think I need to remind you of one important part of that NAR conspiracy theory because it brings us to today's topic. One of the main accusations about the NAR is that its supposed members are accused of something so terrible. I can hardly bring myself to say it out loud. Parents, if you have small children listening to this, cover their ears because this is so egregious. It's so maniacal. It's so nefarious that one can only say, may God have mercy on their souls. These people being accused of associating with this fictitious society called the NAR are accused of, are you ready for it? Believing that there are still apostles and prophets in the world today. Yep, that's right, folks. That's the big heresy. That's the big blasphemy. It's by far the biggest issue raised by these critics. And in fact, it's so significant that it's right there in the name, the new apostolic reformation. And not only is this belief in modern apostles a chief concern for those evangelical heresy hunters, it also serves as a kind of shibboleth that immediately exposes anyone who believes in apostolic ministry as one of those NAR heretics. And it cuts both ways because not only does belief in the ongoing ministries of, of apostles immediately unmask someone as being part of the NER, but also if someone's accused of being a part of the NER, you can pretty much assume that they also believe that there are apostles and prophets. And so, you know, in that last podcast I did about the NER, several times I was tempted to just go down a rabbit trail and talk about the idea of modern apostles because it's such an important central issue in this whole NER conversation that you really can't adequately address the NER controversy without addressing this issue. But for the most part, I resisted the temptation because I just knew that it was a subject that was far too vast. And in order to do it any justice, I would need to do a podcast just on that subject. And I promised I would do that in the next podcast. So here we are. Okay. So where to begin? I think, first of all, it would be worthwhile to simply reframe the conversation and the controversy that we're dealing with here. Because honestly, I'll bet that many of you aren't even really aware of this debate. And so I'd like to start by playing this little video montage that shows a number of cessationist teachers making some pretty unambiguous statements about the NAR and about this issue of modern apostles. Let's watch. A new form of charismania, bringing reproach on the Holy Spirit called the uh, New Apostolic Reformation, NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation. It is not new, it is not apostolic, and it is not a reformation, by the way. It is like grape nuts. It's not grapes and it's not nuts. And here's what their basic claim is, that the Holy Spirit has revealed to them that in the year 2001, we entered into the second apostolic age. In the year 2001, we entered into the second apostolic age. What does that mean? It means that the long-lost offices of New Testament prophet and New Testament apostle have been restored. That, that the Holy Spirit has given um, the, the power of prophecy and the power and authority of an apostle to certain people in this generation of the church since 2001. And dear friends, there are no modern day apostles today. There is not a single person alive on the face of the earth today who meets even one of these requirements, much less all three. Not even one, much less all three. I want to be very, very clear on this. The office of apostle has ceased. Today, many false teachers will claim to be apostles or that God will appoint new apostles. They'll say they've seen the risen Lord and were personally appointed by God. Some might not use the word apostle, but they will claim to have seen Christ and been given new revelation you won't find in the scriptures. Avoid such liars and heretics. The office of apostleship is closed. Thanks for applying. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 that he was the last apostle to be appointed. No others would come after him. When the apostle John died at the end of the first century, the apostolic age came to an end. And it's interesting. Um, a lot of people today will call themselves apostles. And let me say unequivocally, we have no apostles today. Amen. They're, they're gone. The age of the apostles is over. There are no apostles today. 
according to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, the apostles, right, and the prophets were the foundation upon which the church is built. I don't know how many foundations your house has. Mine only has one. Huh? The foundation is done. We do not have apostles today. The apostles have the authority to give us the scriptures. We do not have people today who have the authority to give us the scriptures. We do not have apostles today. Okay, so obviously this is a contentious issue. And hopefully you can see how that question of modern apostles relates to that whole NAR controversy. And so as we begin today, let me just start by clarifying both what we are and what we are not talking about. The title of this episode is, Are There Apostles in the Church Today? And the answer to this question is, it depends. You'll notice I answer a lot of questions like that. It depends on how you define apostle. Of course, I don't believe there's anyone today that's an apostle in the way that the original 12 were apostles. No one today was an eyewitness of the resurrection. No one today has been given authoritative teaching for the church. Nobody today can write scripture. Nobody today has their names engraved on the foundations of the New Jerusalem. Nobody today is mentioned in the Bible. Nobody today was chosen and commissioned and deputized by Jesus himself in the way that the original 12 were. And anybody who claims otherwise ought to be defrocked, excommunicated, rejected, and avoided at all costs. But frankly, I don't know of anyone who believes in modern apostles who thinks that modern apostles are the same as the original 12. And so in that sense, it seems to be a pretty open and shut case. The cessationist says, we don't believe that there are any modern apostles like the original 12. The continuation says, we don't believe that either. Seems like that should be the end of the conversation. But actually, the cessationist means not only to eliminate the possibility of any modern apostles like the 12, they mean to eliminate the possibility of any modern apostles at all. And what I believe that the scriptures clearly teach is that there are true five-fold ministry apostles like the ones described in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 that have been given as gifts to the church by the resurrected Christ. And these apostles, although they're not on the same level as the original 12, in other words, they don't have universal church authority, they don't write scripture, yet they are apostles nonetheless, and not merely missionaries or messengers in some generic sense. They are called, they are commissioned, they are sent by Christ to do apostolic work and to function in an apostolic office. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, but that's the case that I'm going to try to make today. And what I've just described to you is not some fringe belief held by a tiny sect somewhere on the edges of orthodoxy. This is actually taken for granted by hundreds of millions of Bible-believing Christians around the world. And if you consider the fact that Roman Catholics and the Orthodox churches believe that their bishops are the direct successors of the original 12 apostles, and you take into consideration the fact that most of those who believe in modern apostles are using that terminology in a way that's roughly equivalent to the way that other groups use terms like overseer and superintendent and bishop and so on, you'll realize that beyond some debatable semantics, this is pretty conventional Christianity. And so why then are some people so upset by the idea that there might be modern apostles? Well, there's a couple reasons. First, there are a few wingnuts out there who are doing and teaching crazy things, and they call themselves apostles. There's also some heretical groups, even some cults that use this terminology. For example, the Mormons claim to have 12 modern-day apostles. And add to that the fact that the term apostle seems exceptionally grandiose to most Christians. Because let's just be honest, the original 12 representatives of Jesus were called the apostles. So it can feel weird when somebody identifies themselves as an apostle today. And honestly, I get it. That's understandable. Remember, I mentioned in that last podcast that I was in Brazil in a service where in one night they ordained a thousand apostles. And so I'm standing there on the platform next to the leader, and I turned to him and I said, if they're apostles, what does that make you? And I said it to him sort of half joking and expecting a lighthearted reply. And he looked at me with a straight face, perfectly serious. He said, I'm the patriarch. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, I'm standing on holy ground here. Yeah, the whole thing felt a little strange. It, it felt presumptuous. And I can imagine that's something like what many people feel when they hear talk of modern-day apostles. Also, I've known people that have claimed the title of apostle with virtually no fruit and no evidence for that claim. I've known young ministers in their mid to late 20s that have claimed to be apostles. In some denominations, the title apostle is as common as pastor is in other denominations. And sometimes it's used to the point that it seems to have no real weight. And honestly, 
the term in those circles kind of loses its significance because everybody's using it. And again, so I understand where people are coming from that feel uncomfortable with this. But then there are those that have gone to the complete opposite extreme. And in their attempt to avoid one ditch, they've gone so far to the other side that they've fallen into the ditch on the opposite side of the road. And you heard, as they said in that montage we played earlier, that no one today is an apostle. And in fact, according to these people, even most of the apostles mentioned in the New Testament weren't really true apostles. And in their mind, this is what is necessary to protect the unequaled status of the original apostles, and then by extension, to protect the closed canon of Scripture. But what I'm going to argue today is that both of these extreme views are wrong. And I'm especially taking exception with the ones that claim that the apostolic gift has passed away because I believe that it requires an approach to biblical interpretation that sets a very dangerous precedent. We'll get into that more. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just take a step back and let me make a couple preliminary remarks for the sake of clarity. I think it's always good just to clarify language, especially when we're trying to communicate clearly around a, a complex and nuanced subject that involves unusual vocabulary. And so you'll notice that I'm using the word cessationist when I refer to those who teach that there are no apostles and prophets. Now, some of you might be familiar with the term cessationist. Others may have something else in mind when you hear the word. For example, typically when we use the word cessationist, we're talking about someone who believes that the more supernatural gifts of the Spirit, like prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues, miracles, healings, and so on, that we read about in Scripture have ceased. Thus, they are a cessationist. cessationist. And then on the other side, we have those who believe that all of the gifts continue, and we are called continuationists. Now, I'm using the term cessationist to refer not only to those that believe that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased, but also to those who believe that these offices of apostle and prophet have ceased. Why? Well, these offices are also gifts. In Ephesians 4, when Paul is talking about the gifts that the victorious Christ gave to the church, he identifies these gifts as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, or pastor-teachers, depending on how you translate. And then in other places, Paul kind of mixes these gifts of office with what we often think of as the charismata. For example, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, and God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. So you can see how apostles and prophets here are right in the mix with miracles and tongues. Now, I could talk a lot more about the significance of that, but for our purposes today, just understand that I'm using the term cessationist to refer not only to people who believe that the gift of the Spirit have ceased, but also to those who believe that the apostolic gift has ceased, and I believe that's an appropriate label for them. Also, when it comes to the idea of modern apostles, I want to be careful in this discussion not to conflate separate, unrelated issues. The question we're discussing today is whether or not the apostolic gift is for today, according to Scripture. But that is a different question from, for example, what level of authority modern apostles might possess. And often these issues are just conflated. People say things like, if there are apostles today, they can write Scripture. Or, if there are apostles today, they can exercise authority over the whole church. But that's not true. Let's not automatically jump to these conclusions that don't follow. It really just convolutes the issue at hand. What we need to do is focus on solving one problem at a time. First, we need to figure out if there are apostles in the church today according to Scripture. That's what the podcast is about. And if we determine that there are apostles today, then we can take the next step of discussing what modern apostles might be like and what they might do in a practical sense. Also, I want to define another term that I might use a few times today because it really summarizes the whole problem, as you'll see in a moment. And that's the term category error or category mistake. And a category mistake happens when you confuse the characteristics of one category with another, like the name implies. And this becomes particularly likely to happen when we're talking about multiple categories that all carry the same name or similar names. The guy that came up with this, his name was Gilbert Ryle, and he used as an example of this a university. And uh, he, he said, imagine somebody is visiting Oxford and they're taking a guided tour and they go see the library and they see the dorms and these different educational facilities. And then at the end of the tour, they say to the guide, but where is the university? And so Gilbert Ryle is saying what they've done is they've confused the category of university with the various buildings that are components of the university. And that same thing often happens in this debate with apostles. The term apostles is a category that encompasses several different subcategories. 
And this is really not that difficult to understand. So let me just go ahead and give you my simple take on this thing right here. And then I'll probably spend, you know, the rest of the podcast unpacking this. But let's just have a look at this little chart that I've created. And I'll try to describe this uh, verbally as well for those of you that might be listening instead of watching. But here we have three categories of apostles on a vertical column. And I'm putting these in a kind of hierarchy with the 12 apostles at the top. Now, these are the original apostles of Jesus. This group is made up of 11 of Jesus' original apostles. I memorized their names when I was a kid in Sunday school. It's Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, and Bartholomew. And then Judas was replaced with Matthias. So that is what is known as the 12. Now, all of these men have a couple things in common. They were all with Jesus throughout the entirety of his earthly ministry, from the time that he was baptized to the time that he ascended into heaven. All of them were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And all of them, except for Matthias, were personally hand-selected by Jesus to be one of his disciples. All of them died in the first century. No one outside of that group will ever be part of that group. Okay, so that's the top category. Then, underneath the 12 apostles, we have five-fold apostles. These are the ones that are mentioned in Ephesians 4. These apostles are given, just like prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers, as gifts to the church to help the body of Christ until we reach a state of maturity. And then finally, at the bottom, we have generic messengers. Because as I'll show you later, the term apostle can be used in this generic sense as well. And sometimes cessationists will say that the only kind of apostles that we have today are in this category of generic messengers. And they'll point to missionaries as an example of this. The reason they do that is because the word missionary comes from the Latin translation of the Greek word apostello, which is where we get the English word apostle. Now, all of that's true, but honestly, to link any biblical reference of apostles to a concept that was developed hundreds of years later is obviously anachronistic and is in itself a kind of category error. Now, let's just let this sink in for a second. The term apostle can be used for any of these subcategories as well as the overarching category to which they all belong. But if you say, like some of those guys in the montage I played earlier, that there are no apostles today, unless you clarify what you're talking about, you're committing a category mistake. Now, if you mean that there are no apostles in this top category, the 12 apostles, you're right. But if you mean that there are no apostles in either of these other categories, you're dead wrong, as I'll show you in this podcast. But what cessationists do is they mistake the category of the 12 apostles with the overarching category of apostles. And then they make unbelievably stupid assertions like there are no apostles today. And this is a textbook example of a category mistake. Okay, one more thing. Please just keep in mind that there is no way that I can possibly cover every facet of this discussion in one podcast. I can just hear all of the negative comments from the critics of what I missed and what I didn't cover and what I didn't adequately explain. Listen, this subject is vast. It could easily fill a large book or even several large books. And so there's no way that I'm going to be able to answer every question in one episode. I don't even claim to have all the answers. There's a lot about the subject that I don't understand. But I do think that the question, do apostles exist today, is something we can confidently address from Scripture. And so I'm going to try my best to stick to that. But first, let me just digress quickly to address a couple of the more important practical concerns before we get into the weeds. And the first of these practical concerns that I'd like to address is the way that critics feel that if there were apostles in the earth today, it might present the potential for the abuse of authority. And this kind of relates to that whole category mistake issue, because if we're talking about there being apostles today like the original 12, then yes, that would be a legitimate concern. But when we talk about apostles in our modern context, we're usually talking about that second category, what I was calling the five-fold apostles. And when we talk about apostles like this, we're basically talking about someone who is in a position of leadership over a church or a group of churches. That might be regional, it might even be denomination-wide, or in some cases, it's simply referring to the churches that the apostle himself or herself founded and over which he's exerting some level of authority. And what you'll find in most cases, certainly in all of them that I'm aware of, is that in a practical sense, these people are just using the term of apostle as another way of saying a bishop or an overseer or a presbyter or a superintendent, except they're trying to get closer to a more New Testament paradigm of that leadership category, like what we see operating in the ministry of the Apostle Paul relative to the churches that he founded. And so 
many of these debates about apostolic authority are just red herrings. Now, for those of you that are non-native English speakers, I have a lot of those in my audience, let me just clarify that a red herring in the context of an argument is something irrelevant that distracts from the important question at hand. And again, that's exactly what this concern about the abuse of authority is. It's an irrelevant distraction from the important question of whether or not, according to Scripture, the apostolic gift is still in operation. In reality, the same kind of authority is being exercised by church leaders and by denominational leaders across the board, whether the ones exercising that authority are going by the term apostolic or not. Now, that's not to say that every church has people in apostolic-type roles, because some don't. But nearly every movement has apostolic figures in its founding and or in its ongoing ecclesiastical leadership. Are you Presbyterian? Your founder, John Knox, was an extremely apostolic figure. Are you Methodist? Your founder, John Wesley, was also an extremely apostolic figure. You've got guys like Roger Williams, George Fox, Richard Allen, and many, many others who I would consider apostolic figures in church history. And in reality, you can identify these kinds of men and women in nearly every Christian denomination and movement that there has ever been. Now, that does not mean that these apostolic figures were on the same level as the 12 apostles. Of course not. What it means, in the most practical sense, is that they were people who had the gift and the grace to establish churches. Now, there's more to being an apostle than simply planting churches. But I'm trying to be as uncomplicated as possible at this stage. Because most of the time, when we're talking about people who are apostles or apostolic in our modern context, we're talking about people who are establishing churches or overseeing church movements or something like that. And just to be perfectly clear, I'm not aware of any of these church movements that claim apostolic leadership in which they're trying to exercise authority over the universal church or write new scripture or anything like that. Now, if it's the case that someone is trying to exert authority far beyond the scope of their jurisdiction, which is certainly possible, I don't support that. But that's a separate issue. It has nothing to do with the question at hand because abuse of authority exists in every movement and in every denomination, and we'll have to deal with that regardless of what titles are being used. It's not like you can just eliminate abuse by eliminating the title of apostle. There are bishops and presbyters and overseers and superintendents who abuse their authority as well. Heck, there's pastors who abuse their authority. There's Sunday school teachers that abuse their authority. Let's not pretend that this is something unique to people who call themselves apostles. Now, there's one more practical issue I'd like to address before we dive into the theological considerations, and it has to do with the closed canon of Scripture. And this is a big one in terms of the main concerns raised by those opposed to the idea of modern apostles. The logic goes like this. If there were apostles today, they would be able to write scripture. And of course, no one today can write scripture, so no one today can be an apostle. Now, honestly, that's just such muddle thinking that I feel dumber for even having uttered that cacophony of mendacity. But trust me, I'm not strawmanning this. Let me read this quote directly from a book called To Be Continued, are the miraculous gifts for today. And actually, I'm going to be referring to this book quite a bit today. This book is written by a man named Samuel E. Waldron, and he writes, the entire Christian church acknowledges that no new book has been added to the canon of the New Testament for almost 20 centuries. There is no debate about this. The New Testament gains its authority from the endorsement of the apostles and the principle of apostolic authority. This is so, first, because the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20, Matthew 16.17, and second, because only an apostle of Christ can claim to speak the word of Christ. It is the apostle of Christ that is as the man himself. Thus, apostles had either to write or endorse each book of the New Testament. The fact of the closed character of the canon, therefore, assumes and implies the closed character of the apostolate, end quote. Now, listen to that last sentence again. The fact of the closed character of the canon, therefore, assumes and implies the closed character of the apostolate. Why? Because, according to Waldron, Apostles had either to write or endorse each book of the New Testament. But that's not technically true, is it? Apostles didn't have to write or endorse each book of the New Testament. The apostles had to. Now, there's a big difference between apostles and the apostles. Apostles are a gift given by Christ to his church. The apostles were 12 very special men who filled a unique role in the history of the church. But now Waldron has confused the apostles with apostles. And he says that since the apostles wrote or endorsed scripture, and since the apostles were apostles, that means that apostles had to write or endorse scripture. And since no one today can write or endorse scripture, no one today can be an apostle. 
Do you see the glaring logical fallacy? Do you see the obvious category mistake taking place here? It's so amazing to me how quite reasonable and rational people can hear a deduction like this and they can just accept it without going, hold on, this doesn't add up. Confusing apostles with the 12 apostles is like confusing car drivers with NASCAR drivers. Yes, all NASCAR drivers drive cars, but not everyone who drives a car is a NASCAR driver. Now, let's just say NASCAR went out of business, and as a result, there were no more NASCAR drivers. Does that mean, therefore, that no one could ever drive a car again? Do you see it? Car drivers is like that overarching category. NASCAR drivers are a subcategory of car drivers. But there's other categories of car drivers as well, like Formula One car drivers and soccer mom car drivers. So when you eliminate one of those subcategories, it doesn't eliminate the overarching category. Does that make sense? Let me try to apply this in a way that might be a little bit more contemporary. And you tell me if you can see the problem. Let's use another historical document as an example, like, oh, I don't know, the Declaration of Independence. Now, I know this isn't exactly the same as the Bible. The Bible is obviously inspired and authoritative and sacred on a completely different level, but I think it will work for the sake of argument. Now, everyone who signed the Declaration of Independence was either a president or a congressman or a general or some other kind of diplomat, right? But now, what if I concluded that since the Declaration of Independence is a closed historical document, and since we don't want anybody to change it, we need to make sure that there is never any more presidents or congressmen or generals or diplomats of any kind. Because if we acknowledge any modern presidents or congressmen or generals or diplomats, they might be able to change the Declaration of Independence. What would you think about that reasoning? Well, hopefully you'd be able to see that this is just a ridiculous deduction. The roles those men played were not limited to the formation of special authoritative documents. Obviously, a president today can't modify the Declaration of Independence, but we still need presidents today because there are things presidents did that we still need presidents to do. Now, I know I'm beating a dead horse here. I'm not trying to be condescending. But if it's so simple, why do cessationists keep getting it so wrong? It's true that there were some apostles, yes, that contributed to the formation of our New Testaments. Not all. Some did. And it's true that the canon of Scripture is closed. It's true that it can't be modified. But to conclude from those two premises that there are no more apostles today is just a ridiculous non sequitur. Now, I'm not saying these things to disparage or undermine the significance of the 12 apostles. Only the 12 were present to hear all of the teachings of Jesus through his entire earthly ministry. They were not only eyewitnesses, they were ear witnesses too. And so for this reason, their teachings hold the greatest amount of authority in the Christian church. Jesus never wrote a book. He never wrote a letter. He never engraved anything on stone or bronze. And so what he did was entrust his teaching to his apostles, and then he commissioned those apostles to take that teaching to the world. And so ultimately, the only reliable source of Christ's teachings was his apostles. And what they taught, we don't just take as their own doctrines, but we take them as the teachings of Jesus himself. That's why all of their surviving writings have been added to the canon of Scripture, and only the Twelve had that kind of authority. Now, not everyone who wrote Scripture was one of the Twelve. In fact, some New Testament authors, like Mark and Luke, weren't any kind of apostle. But those non-apostolic writings probably would have been subjected to the approval of the Twelve before being regarded as canonical. And... We know that because even the Apostle Paul submitted his revelations about the gospel to some of the apostles who gave him the right hand of fellowship. You can read about that in Galatians 2. And so, the 12 apostles are an extremely important group. And their teachings are authoritative and foundational. There's no question on that point. And if you want to link the passing of the 12 apostles with the closing of the canon, that's perfectly reasonable. But to say that because the canon is closed, there can be no more apostles at all that's just a horrendous category error. And so, just to reiterate, when we talk about the idea of modern apostles, we're not talking about apostles like the 12. We're talking about a different category of apostles that's described in Ephesians 4.12, which says that they were given for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. So here's the question. Is that function still necessary? Is that an ongoing role? If so, then why would we assume without any biblical warrant that the gift is obsolete? Now, in all honesty, I'm not sure if anyone is genuinely concerned about modern-day apostles adding to the closed canon. Most likely, this is just another one of those red herrings. I don't know anyone in any true Christian denomination that believes that they can add to the Scriptures. I don't know anyone claiming to be an apostle who is also claiming to be able to write Scripture. In fact, even Sam Waldron himself admits this in his book when he says, quote, the entire Christian church acknowledges that no new book has been added to the canon of the New Testament 
for almost 20 centuries. There is no debate about this. Agreed. There is no debate about this. So why are we using this fake concern about the preservation of the canon as a premise for insisting that the apostolic gift has ceased? So now let's just set those practical concerns to the side for a moment. The possibility of abuse of authority, the concern about the canon being compromised, these are irrelevant to the question at hand. If the Bible teaches that the apostolic gift continues, then it continues. If the Bible teaches that the apostolic gift has ceased, then it's ceased, period, end of discussion. So that's where we're going to go now. And let me just give you my outline. First, I just want to take a couple of minutes to sketch out the basics about what apostles are and what they do. And then I want to address a couple of the big strategies that cessationists use to make the difficult case that there are no more apostles. And then I'll end by addressing two of the more important passages that are often debated whenever the subject is raised. And so let's start with some basics. What is an apostle? The Greek word apostolos is a compound word that is formed by putting the preposition apo, which means off or away, with stelo, which means to send. So it means one sent off or sent one. And in Greek thought, they're sent with a special task to perform or with a special message to deliver as a representative of the sender. So the one sent in this context, is not merely a delivery person like an ancient mailman or something. The apostle carries some or all of the authority of the one that sent him and is even in some cases to act on the sender's behalf. In the first century Greco-Roman world, we find this word apostle used in uh, several different arenas. It's used in the religious world, it's used in the political world, the legal world, military, and even commercial world. The term was used in a lot of different ways. It could refer to a king's ambassador, it could refer to a legal representative. It could refer to a Navy admiral. It could refer to a military expedition or a band of colonists or even to their settlement. And so that's pretty broad, isn't it? In fact, the word apostle could even refer to inanimate objects like a Navy ship or an official letter or even a bill of sale. And so the bottom line is this. The word apostle was a common word. It had lots of different applications. But the common thread was that it was someone or something that was being sent to represent the sender. Now, according to Luke 6.13, very early on in Christ's ministry, Jesus chose this word apostolos, or more likely the Aramaic equivalent, and this concept of a sent one to describe his 12 disciples. And so, for anyone who understood what that word meant, it should have been obvious from the very beginning what Jesus had in mind for these 12 men. They were going to be sent out on his behalf as representatives. But there's more to it than that. Because the implications here are deeper than what you might get just from a superficial translation of the Greek word. Because, of course, you know, Jesus was known for using concepts that were familiar to people living in the Roman Empire in the first century. He did that with lots of things, right? Like, remember one time he used a Roman coin as an illustration in a sermon. Give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give unto God what belongs to God. Another time he was teaching and he said that if someone compels you to go one mile, go with him too. That's where we get the expression in English, go the extra mile. But a first century Jew living in the Roman Empire would have had a totally different understanding in a very specific way of what Jesus was talking about because there was a Roman law at the time that allowed a Roman soldier to force any Jewish civilian to carry his luggage for up to a mile. So as you can imagine, the Jews obviously hated this. So when Jesus said, if someone compels you to go one mile, go two, this was not just some cliche. It was deeply personal and very culturally relevant. So again, Jesus did this all the time. He employed concepts and illustrations that would have been familiar to an audience of Jews living in the Greco-Roman world in the first century. And at first glance, it might seem like that's what Jesus is doing here when he uses the word apostolos. It's a Greek word after all, and it was widely used at the time, it was well understood. But when we think of the word apostle, we need to remember that what's more important to understand is not just the way that it was used in the Greek speaking world, but the way that this concept would have translated into the Hebrew way of thinking. Remember the story of Isaiah when he was called in chapter 6 to be a prophet. It says that he saw the Lord, some exalted on his throne. He describes flaming angels and this whole scene that culminates with the Lord asking a very important question. Remember what the Lord says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And of course, Isaiah volunteered. Remember what he said? Here am I, send me. Now that's what a prophet was, someone who was sent by God with a message. And that's also what an apostle is. An apostle is a sent one. Do you see that parallel? Now, the matter of being sent was so important relative to prophetic ministry that it was actually the mark of authenticity for an Old Testament prophet. You can see this illustrated very vividly 
in Jeremiah chapter 23, where the Lord denounces a group of false prophets. Listen to what God says about them in verse 18. But who has stood in the counsel of the Lord that he should see and hear his word? Verse 21, I did not send these false prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. If they had stood in my counsel, they would have announced my words to my people. Do you see it? The prophetic office was all about being sent. Notice that when the Lord denounces these false prophets, he doesn't even comment on the content of their prophetic words. He doesn't say they gave the wrong information. He says, I did not send them. So the picture of a true Old Testament prophet is one that was sent. Now, interestingly, if we go back to Isaiah 6 for a moment, remember where Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and where God asked the question, whom shall I send? The Hebrew verb being used for the word send there is the word shalak. Now, check this out. That word shalak is translated in the Septuagint by the word, can you guess? Apostello. Now, of course, the Septuagint is the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament. And what you have to understand is that for Greek-speaking Jews in the time of Jesus, this book was the Bible. In fact, when the New Testament authors are quoting from the Old Testament, they very often quote directly from the Septuagint rather than the Hebrew. So it's extremely important to realize the way that certain Hebrew words were being translated at that time into Greek, not only because it helps us understand how ancient Greek-speaking Jews would have understood their own scriptures, but also because it shows us how words and concepts in the New Testament map onto parallel words and concepts in the Old Testament. So for example, you might read where Paul says that God sent Jesus to be a propitiation for the remission of sins in Romans 3.25. That's the way it reads in the King James, propitiation. You go, what in the world does the word propitiation mean? So you go to the Greek and you look it up and it's the Greek word hilasterion, which is a word used to talk about appeasing the gods. I mean, it's, it's not a great word. You might imagine people throwing a virgin into an active volcano to satisfy the wrath of some petty local deity. And you might think to yourself, this can't possibly be what Paul is saying about God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, can it? He's not some petty, angry God that has to sacrifice his own son in order to appease his uncontrollable anger, is he? Well, of course not. So why does Paul use that word? Well, one thing you can do to get a better understanding is go to the Septuagint and see how that same word maps onto Old Testament concepts. And what you'll find is very interesting. The word hilasterion is used in the Septuagint to translate the word caporet. Caporet is the word for the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, and more specifically, it was used to refer to the mercy seat between the wings of the cherubim, where the blood of that sacrificial bull was sprinkled on the Day of Atonement. Isn't that amazing? So we realize by looking at the Septuagint that although the word hilasterion had one common meaning in the wider Greek-speaking world, when Paul's using it, he's making reference to the concept of atonement. So again, the Septuagint can help us to see how Greek-speaking Jews in the ancient world, and especially the ones who wrote our New Testament, understood the words and concepts they were using in light of Old Testament scriptures. Now, I don't know what version of the Bible you like to read. I grew up reading and memorizing the King James. And so whenever I quote scripture, I'll almost always quote the King James. Now, I'm, I'm by no means a King James only guy, but because I grew up reading it, the King James language has shaped the way I think. It's molded my vocabulary. So if I quote John 3, 16, I'll still say, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And if I type it out, my spell check highlights the word believeth because nobody talks like that anymore. But it's as much a part of, of me and the way I think as my own name because I've known it and I've quoted it my whole life. And what's more, I have this kind of emotional attachment to it. So when I hear familiar passages read from one of these more colloquial translations, sometimes I just don't feel them as deeply because I don't have that same emotional, sentimental attachment. And that's what the Septuagint was for Greek-speaking Jews in the first century. They had a familiarity with it. They had an emotional attachment to it. And the translation itself was so significant that it would have shaped their thinking and would have molded their vocabulary. And so all of this to say, that when Jesus used the word apostello or apostolos, and when the New Testament writers used the word apostello, they probably would have been thinking less of the normal Greek way the word was used and more of the way that the word was used in their scriptures. Again, remember Isaiah 6, when God says, who shall I send? Again, that's the Hebrew word shalak, which is translated into Greek in the Septuagint by the word apostello. And so when a first century Jew heard the word apostello, 
And when the New Testament writers use the word apostello, it's quite likely that it was actually evoking images of a Hebrew prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah being sent by God. And so that Old Testament prophetic office is the background against which Jesus calls his apostles in the New Testament. And what were Old Testament prophets like? They were called by God, they were transformed by his presence, and then they were sent out on a mission to bring restoration to Israel. And so in a similar way, Jesus calls his apostles and he sends them out as his appointed representatives to proclaim the gospel and to bring restoration into people's lives. And in fact, Jesus probably saw himself as the first apostle. He certainly saw himself as sent by the Father. And when he commissioned the 12, he instructed them to go out as sent ones in that exact same way. Remember John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said, as my Father sent me, even so I send you. There it is again. When he says, as the Father sent me, it uses the Greek word apostello again. And that's referring to Jesus himself. Then we see it again in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. Jesus told them, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. There's the word apostello again, referring to Jesus himself. So think about it like this. The ministry of Jesus begins a new era. Jesus himself is the first of a new order of messengers that are similar to Old Testament prophets, but they're raised to a whole new level because think about it, prophets were often quite helpless. I mean, they told the people what the Lord was saying and they told them that punishment and judgment was coming, but very often the people didn't listen and very often the prophets just had to stand by and watch helplessly as the nation went into judgment or exile or whatever. But apostles are different. They don't just deliver a message and then stand by helplessly. They themselves have been invested with supernatural power and authority to bring about a whole new kind of restoration that's made available only through the work of Christ. And so that's why Jesus specifically commissioned his apostles to heal people and to cast out demons. Listen, there was no prophet in the Old Testament that had the ability to cast out demons. The first one we see in scripture casting out demons is Jesus. And then he told his apostles to cast out demons as well. He gave them that authority like he had over the powers of darkness. It's hard for us to even, I think, comprehend in our modern church mentality how significant it was that he told them in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That was a unique kind of commission. That was a unique power that was only available through Christ. And yet, even as amazing as it is to have power over sickness and to have power over demonic spirits and so on, there was something that apostles carried that was even more incredible. And this is what makes apostolic ministry really unique. This is what makes apostolic ministry a new covenant office. Because you see, God gives apostles not just to bring restoration to individual lives or even to a nation, but apostles are sent to bring about a corporate collective restoration of the imago Dei, the image of God, which can only be manifested on the earth through the church. And so see this blueprint. Jesus is the first apostle. He's called the chief cornerstone of the household of God in Ephesians 2.20. And it says the foundation is the prophets, presumably of the Old Testament, and the 12 apostles in the New Testament. And then you have the people of God comprising the living stones that grow into a holy temple in the Lord where God dwells by his spirit. Okay, well, it's true that the foundation in that ultimate sense has been laid once for all. Jesus and his first apostles did that work. And actually, if you exegete Ephesians 2.20 correctly, it's not that their work or their writings constitute the foundation. That can be implied. But they themselves in the text are the foundation. Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. So obviously that's unrepeatable. But there is another sense in which every generation and every place on earth needs those who can lay the foundation. That has already been laid afresh in new places and in all times throughout history. Now you might say, that's silly. You're just making that up. Why would we need to lay a foundation that's already been laid? Well, first of all, it's just a little bit of common sense. I mean, if somebody goes to some remote tribe in the Amazon, for example, that's never heard the gospel, somebody's going to need to do the groundwork of preaching the gospel and teaching the Bible and starting a local community of believers in that new place. And it's hard to imagine something more foundational than that. So the foundation for the church might be laid in a historical sense, in a universal sense, but we still need to do the practical work of laying the foundation that has been laid afresh in new places in our time. And that's what I would consider apostolic work. And if you think I'm stretching this, keep in mind, this is literally what the apostle Paul says 
about his own apostolic ministry in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, people misread this verse all the time. They think it says no one can lay a foundation because it has been laid. But that's not what it says. He says no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid. And I hear cessationists say all the time, how many times can you lay a house's foundation? And of course, the obvious answer is only once, except we're not talking about a literal house. This is a metaphor. You'll get in all kinds of trouble if you try to apply these metaphors with a strictness that takes you away from the principle it's trying to illustrate. Open your ears. Pay attention to what Paul is actually saying in context. Paul had helped establish the church in Corinth. He did that, like he said, as a skilled master builder by laying the foundation in Corinth that had already been laid before Paul was even converted. That foundation is Christ and his apostles. And the cessationists might say, no, 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 Paul is special. Paul is a real apostle who wrote scripture. And it's the scriptures that Paul wrote that are the foundation. That's why Paul could lay them and we can't because we can't write scripture and Paul did. But obviously the problem with that view is that when Paul says, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, past tense, that itself is part of the scripture that Paul wrote. So if the foundation was already laid in the past, as Paul was writing his scripture, his scripture can't be the foundation he's writing about, can it? So the foundation of the church is Christ and the original 12 apostles. That foundation has been laid and it will never be repeated again. Paul himself couldn't lay a different foundation than that which had already been laid. But he did need to lay it afresh in Corinth and in Rome and in Thessalonica and so on in his day. But guess what? That foundation that has already been laid needs to be laid afresh in every time, every tribe, every nation, and every generation throughout the world and throughout history. That's the heart of the Great Commission, and that's apostolic work. And so again, just to be perfectly clear, my understanding is that apostolic work today is foundational only in a local sense, not in a universal sense. In the universal sense, the foundation was laid 2,000 years ago, but in a local sense, that's an ongoing task. And when we do foundational work today, we're only laying the foundation that's already been laid, which is Christ. It's the teaching of the 12 apostles. It's the faith once delivered to the saints. We're not coming up with some new scripture. We're not inventing new doctrines. We're not laying foundations for a new religion. We're just laying, in a practical and local sense, the foundation that was already laid, just like the Apostle Paul said. Now, I know that even with all of these qualifiers, just using the word foundational can be a real stumbling block when it's used in reference to modern apostolic work. Nuance is really difficult for some people. And there are some folks, they just can't tolerate the same word being used in different ways. And they feel like the word foundational would give modern apostles too much power. And so, you know what? Honestly, I'm happy to concede this territory. Maybe we don't need to call modern apostolic work foundational at all. Maybe we just say that modern apostles are building upon the foundation. That's fine with me too. We can debate all of these different things about what modern apostolic work might look like. And we can adjust the semantics. What I won't concede is that the gift continues. And so, apostles today are sent ones who go out representing Christ, carrying blueprints to establish communities of believers throughout the world, built on the foundation of Jesus Christ himself, and obviously, we call these communities churches. And so, in a practical sense, often apostles, because of the grace of their lives, establish many churches. Sometimes those churches continue to remain connected through fellowships or networks or even denominations. Sometimes they're independent. I know people that have actually started themselves hundreds of churches that in some cases they still oversee in some way. And that's most often what we're talking about when we refer to apostolic ministry today. And I think that's absolutely appropriate. Now, there are also some qualifications that apostles should probably live up to that have to do with integrity and character and so on. We get those from what the apostle Paul says about his own life and what qualified him to be an apostle. But I'm not going to get into that right now because it would take this into a totally different direction. The bottom line is this question. Are there still apostles today, or did the last apostle die out in the first century? That's the question. So now that I've given a basic description of what apostles are and what apostles do, let's dig into the controversy. And I think a good way to do that is by starting with what we know and we can all agree on, and that will give us a set of first principles that we can kind of build on and then we'll try to systematically get closer and closer to what remains mysterious. First of all, let me just emphasize this point. Apostles are a legitimate 
and biblical category. No Bible-believing Christian can deny that. And I was reading the other day about a cult that has leaders called cosmic masters. I thought that was pretty funny. Can you imagine sitting next to somebody on a plane and you say, what do you do for a living? And they say, I'm a cosmic master. And you're like, okay, can you pass the peanuts, cosmic master? We're not talking here about some weird extra biblical thing like cosmic masters. It's not even like we're talking about widely accepted extra biblical categories like popes or overseers or superintendents or something like that. There are apostles in scripture. In fact, that's where we get the concept. And every Bible-believing Christian accepts that there, are bio, that there are apostles in Scripture. And so we're not arguing here about whether or not the gift itself is biblical. The argument is over whether or not the gift continues today or ceased in the first century. Okay, so again, we all agree that the Bible clearly affirms the apostolic gift in office. Here's another thing we can all agree on. The Bible never explicitly says that the gifts will cease or be revoked. Now, whether the Bible implies that in some way, that's an open question. That's what this podcast is about. But since the Bible clearly affirms that the apostolic gift is valid, and since it never explicitly says the gift will cease or be discontinued, and in fact, since it seems to strongly indicate the exact opposite, the burden of proof then is on those who want to argue the gift has ceased. What evidence is there for such a claim? And I'll just tell you, it's a really difficult case to make from Scripture because, again, not only does Scripture never explicitly say that the apostolic gift will cease, it seems to indicate the exact opposite. Now, why do I say that? Well, first... All those cessationists would like you to believe that apostles were a small, rare, closed group. In reality, when you read your New Testament, it looks like apostles are pretty common in the early church. And in fact, the New Testament mentions apostles far more than pastors, teachers, or evangelists. It's very clear that there are more apostles in the early church than the original 12. And new apostles keep coming on the scene all the way to the very end of the biblical record, 70 or 80 years after the original disciples. Okay, so... That's the first thing. Second, the scriptures tell us what the apostolic gift is for. Ephesians 4.12 says that apostles are given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Is that still necessary? Do we still need to be equipped? Then why would we assume that we don't need any of the gifts that are given for that purpose? Third, and this in my mind should end the debate completely, the next verse there in Ephesians 4 tells us exactly how long we're going to have apostles. It says we're going to have them until... We all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Has that happened yet? Have we attained to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? I think not. So then why would we assume without any biblical warrant that any of these gifts are no longer given or necessary? Now, obviously cessationists have things to say about Ephesians 4. We'll get to that in a little bit. But for now, let's just say that again, it's a very difficult case to make from Scripture that apostles are no longer given to the church, at least in the same way that evangelists, pastors, and teachers are. And so one of the common ways that cessationists try to make a more compelling case, since Scripture doesn't help them out very much, is they appeal to history. They say, like you heard John MacArthur say in that montage I played earlier, that these crazy NAR people believe that the long-lost offices of New Testament prophet and New Testament apostle have been restored. And admittedly, that does sound weird. So cessationists want you to take for granted that there were no more apostles after the original 12 died. Like John MacArthur said, until about 2001, when suddenly charismatics claimed that we entered into a second apostolic age. Personally, I've never heard anything like that before. MacArthur loves to take some one-off thing that some charismatics said one time in some conference somewhere and then present it as something that all charismatics believe and teach. It's beyond ridiculous. Here's what we do know, that the 12 apostles were not the only apostles. There are many more apostles mentioned in the New Testament, but even... Beyond that first generation, like I said, we know from Scripture that there continued to be apostles until the very end of the biblical record. And you can see that in Revelation 2, where Jesus commended the church in Ephesus for testing those who claimed to be apostles, but were not. Now, why would they need to test apostles in the last decade of the first century if none were appointed after the mid-30s AD? There's also the Didache. Now, the Didache is obviously non-canonical, but... For those that don't know, it's probably the oldest non-canonical Christian writing that we have dated to the late first century or even the early second century. And it gives us a glimpse into the life and the doctrine and the practice of the early church. So listen to this passage from the Didache. As regards apostles and prophets, according to the gospel's directions, this is how you are to act. Every apostle who comes to you should be welcomed as the Lord, but he is not to stay more than a day or two days if it is really necessary. If he stays for three days, he's a false prophet. 
So whether this is late first or early second century, it seems that it was just taken for granted that there were apostles and prophets in the early church that would travel around, they would visit churches, and they would stay in people's homes. And this is obviously not talking about the 12 apostles or Paul or one of the well-known apostles because it says that if they stay too long, they're a false prophet. Now, I'm not sure what that was all about, but the point is that apostles and prophets were common enough in the early church that we actually have instructions about how to treat them when they come over to your house. But even beyond that, I'm sure that you're aware that both the Catholic and Orthodox churches, which, by the way, is what the church was for most of church history, both believe in the idea of apostolic succession, meaning that they believe that they can trace their heritage back to the original 12 apostles through a continuous line of succession through their bishops. Now, they use the term bishop instead of apostle, probably because they want to reserve the term for the original 12, and probably because they want to avoid some of the confusion that I'm wading through in this podcast. But here's the reality. If their bishops or archbishops are the actual direct successors of the original 12 apostles, and they're literally claiming direct apostolic succession, then they're obviously assuming some level of apostolic authority, even if they're not using the word apostle. Now, as far as I know, there was really no debate about the issue of apostolic succession until around the time of the Reformation. But here's something really interesting. Even John Calvin, who was one of the chief opponents of the idea of apostolic succession, even John Calvin was far less dogmatic than many modern Calvinists are on the question of whether or not the apostolic and prophetic gift continues. See, Calvin considered apostles and prophets to be extraordinary offices of the church as opposed to ordinary offices in which category he put pastors and teachers. However, even so, he didn't shut the door completely to the possibility that modern apostles and prophets might exist. His view was that although these extraordinary offices of the church, that is to say apostles and prophets, were not the norm, he was willing to say that from time to time God revives these offices when the need arises. Here's an exact quote. Quote, the Lord raised up the first three apostles, prophets, and evangelists at the beginning of his kingdom and now and again revives them as the need of the times demands, end quote. So even Calvin was more nuanced in his view than most modern cessationists. Now, unfortunately, his teaching helped pave the way for some of the more extreme views on the total cessation of the apostolic and prophetic offices and also on the cessation of the gifts of the Spirit, which is why, by the way, it's primarily within reform circles that we find the most dogmatic cessationists, both in terms of the gifts of the Spirit and modern apostles and prophets. Now, having said that, there are even some Pentecostals that reject the idea of modern apostles and prophets, which is quite astonishing, but we'll talk more about that later. But the bottom line is this. The view that cessationists like John MacArthur hold of the total cessation of the apostolic gift is not some historically unanimously held position of the church. Not at all. In fact, MacArthur's view is the new and novel take on the subject. And it's also the minority view, by the way. But the bottom line is this. Anyone looking to make a case that there are no more apostles has a very difficult road to hoe. They need to be really good at spinning a story because no one would ever conclude from a straightforward reading of Scripture or an honest look at history that we should expect the apostolic gift to cease. That's something you have to be taught. That's a narrative you have to be coached in, which is why all the proponents of this view sound the same. That's why they have the same arguments. They use the same language. They even have the same silly, poorly thought through sarcastic comments like, how many foundations do you have on your house? They're all copying each other. That's why they all sound the same. Now, let me tell you what would constitute a slam dunk, open and closed case for me. Here's what would be totally convincing. If this were true, I would reject every modern day so-called apostle. Here it is. If only the original 12 were called apostles in scripture, that would create a very clearly defined category that would seem to definitely limit the apostolic gift to a small group of men that lived in the first century. But that's not what we find. It's not even close. In fact, actually, the most prominent apostle in Scripture was not one of the 12 at all. And you know who I'm talking about. It's the apostle Paul. Paul is such a massive monkey wrench. He opens the floodgates because Paul never even met Jesus during his earthly life. And yet, we believe that Paul is every bit as much an apostle as Peter or James or John or any of the 12. So we can't limit the apostles to the 12. That's clear. That means that all Bible-believing Christians even the most cessationist ones, have to admit that there's at least one person besides the 12 who is a true, full-blown apostle. But here's the problem. If you're going to let Paul in, then you need to let Barnabas in too. You know, during their ministry in Iconium, you read about it in Acts 14, Luke refers to Barnabas and Paul twice as, quote, the apostles. 
And this is after they were sent on a clearly apostolic mission together in the previous chapter. And you go read Acts 13 and 14 for yourself. And I think you'll come to the same conclusion that the way the book of Acts represents the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, it demands that we see Barnabas as an apostle on the same level as Paul. The Holy Spirit and the church of Antioch had undeniably sent Barnabas with Paul. They function together. They are both called apostles. Acts even mentions Barnabas before Paul several times in the narrative, which probably means that at least in the beginning of their ministry together, Barnabas was the leader. Now, of course, later on, Paul definitely became the more prominent member of the team. But Barnabas was absolutely no less an apostle than Paul was. And later, of course, in Acts 15, Barnabas goes on his own apostolic journey, which he led. And it's very obvious that Luke is intentionally portraying Barnabas as an apostle like Paul. And if all of that evidence isn't enough, Paul himself includes Barnabas in his own category of apostle by referring to him in 1 Corinthians as an example of an apostle like him who works a trade during his apostolic ministry. And then in Galatians chapter 2, Paul tells the Galatians that the apostles of high reputation gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. So again, if Paul is a true apostle, then so is Barney. So now you've got the original 12 plus Paul and Barnabas. But if you're going to let Paul and Barnabas in the door, you've got to let James in too. Now, I'm not talking about James here, who is the brother of John and a member of the original 12 apostles, the one who died in Acts 12 at the hands of Herod Agrippa. I'm talking about the James, who was one of the natural half-brothers of Jesus, who actually didn't believe in Jesus at first, but later accepted him as Messiah and Lord. And eventually that James became a key leader of the church and was recognized as an apostle. In Acts... James was listed among the, quote, apostles and elders of the church in Jerusalem. So there's good evidence from Acts that James is recognized as an apostle. But if there's any doubt, Paul puts that to rest in his writings because Paul groups James among the apostles of high reputation who were reputed to be pillars, he says, of the church along with Peter and John. Paul also clearly puts James in a group of apostles that came before him in Galatians 1. Then when Paul visited Jerusalem after his conversion, he said in Galatians 1.19, I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Also, Paul puts James among the apostles who saw the resurrected Lord in 1 Corinthians 15. And then in that same passage, in 1 Corinthians 15, we see something there that might indicate that there's actually a whole unnamed group of apostles outside the 12. So it's very possible that there's a lot more apostles in the early church than we even know of. But here's a few more that we do know of. Andronicus and Junius were apostles. In Romans 16, Paul calls them my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles. Then we have Silvanus and Timothy who were apostles as well. Paul tells the Thessalonians, for we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, although we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. So who is Paul talking about here when he refers to we, apostles of Christ? Is it Peter and John and Andrew? No. Paul's letter plainly tells us who they were in 1 Thessalonians 1.1. It was Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. There's no other mention, either in 1 Thessalonians or in Acts, that James or any of the 12 apostles brought the gospel to Thessalonica. The Bible identifies only these three men, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, as the workers who founded the church in that city. And so they are the only possible candidates for Paul's reference to we, apostles of Christ. So according to this passage then, the term apostles of Christ must have included other apostles like Paul who were not a part of the 12 and were not James. Now keep that in mind because the term apostles of Christ is going to become important in a few minutes. So let's just recap. First, it seems clear that there were quite a number of people besides the 12 that were considered apostles in the early church. Second, historically, most of the church believed in apostolic succession up until the time of the Reformation and Even today, most of the church accepts some kind of belief in modern apostles, which means that the belief in the total cessation of the apostolic gift is the minority view, both historically and in the present. Third, the Bible never says that the apostolic gift was withdrawn. And fourth, and most importantly, the Bible seems to indicate that apostles will be given, just like pastors and teachers, until the body of Christ reaches a state of perfection. So in light of all of these things, how do cessationists have any confidence in their claim that there are no more apostles in the earth today. Listen to this extremely bold quote from Sam Waldron. He says, quote, The New Testament makes it clear that apostles of Christ are not given to the church today. They lived only in the first century. We know for sure, therefore, that one gift 
and that the greatest gift has ceased to be given. This clear New Testament teaching provides a vital premise for the argument against continuationism. Unless it wishes to contradict the plainest evidence, continuationism cannot claim that there is no difference in the gifts given to the church today and the gifts given to the church in the first century, end quote. So again, how can Waldron make such a confident statement like, the New Testament makes it clear that apostles of Christ are not given to the church today. We've already seen that the Bible makes no such explicit statement and actually seems to be teeming with evidence to the contrary. Well, there's a very important distinction that Waldron is making here that you need to be aware of. Notice that Waldron does not say the New Testament makes it clear that apostles are not given to the church today. He, he absolutely cannot say that, and he knows it. That's why he's careful to say that it's apostles of Christ that are not given to the church today, because cessationists teach that there are two categories of apostles in the New Testament. They identify these as apostles of Christ and apostles of the churches. Apostles of Christ are what they consider to be the real apostles, like the Twelve and Paul. And then the apostles of the churches are basically all of the other apostles they don't know what to do with. Now, more commonly, you'll see these two categories distinguished as big A and small A apostles. Now, of course, cessationists have different opinions about who was in that big A group. Some limit the big A apostles to just the 12. More commonly, big A apostles are the 12 plus Paul. Many prominent theologians like John MacArthur teach this. I was taught this as well in my youth growing up in a Pentecostal context, and I just assumed that position for many years. But upon closer inspection, we realize that it's a lot more complicated than that. And actually, this simplistic view is really quite misleading, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, some cessationists are willing to accept additional big A apostles if it helps their argument. But honestly, they can't all agree on who should be in this group. And their methods for determining who's in and who's out are quite arbitrary. For example, Sam Waldron accepts Paul as a, as a big A apostle. He accepts James as a big A apostle and perhaps the other half-brothers of Jesus as well, but not Barnabas, not Timothy, not Silas, not Apollos, not Andronicus or Junius. And in any case, that second group, the apostles of the churches or the small apostles, include all of those so-called apostles that are not a part of the big A group. So now, this is really important. You've got to grasp this to understand the debate. Let me just use my chart again. Remember, we have these three categories of apostles that are mentioned in Scripture. There's the 12 at the top, then there's the five-fold apostles, and then there's generic messengers or apostles of the churches at the bottom. Now, here's the problem cessationists have. What do they do with Paul? Paul is the most prolific New Testament author. They can't allow him to be in a category of apostles that exists today because they don't want anybody to be able to claim to be an apostle like Paul. So what they need to do is to get Paul up there into that group with the 12. And by the way, they have the same issue with James. So they really need to find a way to categorize Paul and James with the 12. Then they can close that category and relegate all other apostles in Scripture and in history to this generic category of generic messengers down here. But how can they do that? How can they create this category of apostles that is the 12 plus Paul and James? That category does not exist in Scripture. So what they've done is they've invented a new category that they call apostles of Christ. Now, there's all kinds of problems with this method, as I'll show you in a moment. But this is how they're getting around the inconvenient facts and rigging the system so they can say something like, the New Testament makes it clear that apostles of Christ are not given to the church today. Well, the only way you can say that is because you decided what the term apostles of Christ means. You decided it means the 12 plus Paul and James. The Bible doesn't say that there's a category of apostles called apostles of Christ that includes the 12 plus Paul and James. That's something you concocted. And most people, when they hear that term, don't realize that it's being used in this very special way. Now, imagine I, I started a coffee company. And then I built a website, and I called it the Gourmet Cafe Society. And then I advertised my coffee as rated the number one coffee in the world by the Cafe Gourmet Society. And you say, how did your brand new coffee become the number one coffee in the world so fast? Well, I invented the society that gave it the award. You see, it's a fabrication. It's a manipulation. It's basically a thinly veiled lie. This is what the cessationists have done with the Apostles of Christ terminology. I'm not saying the term doesn't appear in the Bible. It does. What I'm saying is that the cessationists have assigned their own special meaning to it, and then they use it in that special way to make categorical statements that are only true if you qualify them with that special definition. Does that make sense? Listen to what Waldron writes here. He says, We must make a distinction in the New Testament between those who are Apostles of Christ, big A Apostles, 
and those who were simply apostles of the churches, small apostles. Apostles of Christ are Christ's direct legal representatives. Apostles of the churches are the church's legal representatives, and only indirectly and in a lesser sense, the representatives of Christ. You can see apostles of the churches mentioned in Philippians 2.25 and 2 Corinthians 8.23. In the sense of apostles of the churches, apostles do exist today. A missionary sent out by a local church would be an apostle of that church. A representative sent to a meeting of an association of churches is another example of an apostle of that church. They are not, however, official apostles in the sense of being an apostle of Christ. Now, remember, I began this podcast by clarifying that the 12 apostles are obviously a closed group of very special men. There's no debate on that point. So here's how the cessationist plays his little shell game. He starts with what we can all agree on, which is that the 12 were unique. Then he uses the apostles of Christ as a category for the 12. He somehow slips Paul and maybe one or two others into that group, and then he relegates everyone else to that inferior apostles of the church's group and says, see, the New Testament makes it clear that apostles of Christ are not given to the church today. And all the lemmings nod in mindless agreement. But here's the problem. There were many others considered apostles in the early church that were at least, according to Paul, true, full-blown apostles, every bit as much an apostle as Paul himself was. They weren't just missionaries. They weren't just generic messengers. They were apostles, and yet they weren't part of the Twelve. Listen, Paul never claimed to be one of the Twelve. More importantly, he never claimed to be superior to any of the other apostles that were alive at the time. On the contrary, when Paul spoke about other apostles like Andronicus and Junius, he spoke about them as equals. In fact, even when Paul defends his apostolic authority, even when he was being treated as inferior by other apostles, like, for example, what was probably happening in 2 Corinthians 11, even then, Paul makes no mention that he belongs to some exclusive group of apostles. You know, throughout Paul's relationship with the Corinthian church, it seems like he was constantly having to defend his apostolic authority. So let me ask you a question. Why didn't Paul just flash his big A credentials and say, how dare you challenge me as though I'm nothing but a common missionary? You all know that I'm one of them big A apostles. I'm part of that elite group called the Apostles of Christ. I'm not just some little A apostle of the churches like the rest of those so-called apostles. And yet, isn't it interesting that right at the point that Paul should have flashed those big A credentials, he makes no mention that he has membership or even is aware of such a group. And the silence is deafening. It's absurd to think that Paul belonged to a special group like that and then made no mention of it when his very apostolic vocation was on the line. You know, it's also pretty absurd to think that if Paul was one of the only people included in a closed group with the Twelve, that this wouldn't have been common knowledge in the early church. Why would Paul have had to defend his apostleship at all? Do you really think that Peter was having to defend his apostleship? You think James was having to prove that he was an apostle? I highly doubt it. So then why did Paul have to do it? Probably precisely because he was not part of a closed, elite, special group of apostles. He was an apostle in the same category as other post-ascension apostles were. So he doesn't claim to be a member of some special group. But what does he point to as proof of his apostolic credentials? He talks about his suffering. He talks about persecution. Sometimes he talked about how Jesus appeared to him. Sometimes he points to the churches he planted. Sometimes he points to signs and wonders. But nowhere, when Paul defends his apostolic calling, does he mention or even indicate awareness that he belongs to a group that's separate from other lesser apostles. So you might think, well, cessationists have to be getting this distinction between apostles of Christ and apostles of the churches from somewhere, right? Well, let's have a closer look. Here's what is true. Paul does often identify himself as one of Christ's apostles using phrases like apostle of Christ, sometimes exactly that, sometimes a, a variation of that. And he usually does that in his letter greetings. For example, he begins his first letter to the Corinthians like this. Paul called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will and Sosthenes, our brother. And almost all of Paul's letters begin with similar references to his calling. And so when Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Christ or whatever, Waldron is saying that this terminology is being used to distinguish Paul from other lesser apostles. But that's just because Waldron is reading his own presuppositions back into the text. It's far more likely that Paul is just trying to identify himself as an apostle or a sent one from Christ, as opposed to an apostle sent from a human institution. Remember, earlier we gave our definition of the word apostle, and I told you how it was not strictly a religious term. 
the word had many applications in the Greco-Roman world. It had a wide array of uses. And so Paul had a good reason at that time to distinguish himself from other apostles around the empire coming from human institutions. There were many people sent as legal or official representatives of somebody else. So when Paul identifies himself as an apostle, it made sense to add a qualifier like the one that he gave to Galatians when he said, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers that are with me. But Waldron thinks that by calling himself an apostle of Christ, Paul is trying to make himself superior to other apostles or put himself in a special group of elite apostles. And to illustrate how silly and unnecessary this assumption is, let me put it to you like this. You know, I travel a lot. Whenever I enter a foreign country, the immigration officer will almost always ask me what I do for a living. And I will reply that I'm a minister. And very often the follow-up question is this, a minister of what? And this is an appropriate question because the word minister is not only a religious word. Governments have ministers of education, of finance, of transportation, of defense, and of other departments. So I'll clarify that I'm a minister of the gospel. But when I say that I'm a minister of the gospel, I'm not trying to say that I am superior to other ministers, Christian ministers, preachers, like I'm in some superior category. Imagine somebody finding my bio 2,000 years from now and reading that I call myself a minister of the gospel and then concluding from that statement that I was trying to say that I was in a special category of ministers that were better than music ministers or youth ministers or children's ministers because I was a minister of the gospel. That would be ridiculous. When I call myself a minister of the gospel, I'm trying to distinguish myself from worldly ministers of worldly institutions, not from other preachers. In that same way, Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ as opposed to an apostle of Rome or the Sanhedrin or some other earthly establishment. There's no scriptural reason for Paul to try to make himself distinct from or superior to other apostles. But even if for sake of the argument we accept the concept that Paul was trying to use that apostle of Christ terminology as a title to put him in a special category, we would expect in that case to see that the same terminology was being used by the ones that we know are in that category, which is the actual 12 themselves, as a way to identify their own group. But when we look at it, we just don't find this consistently. Yes, Peter uses the term apostle of Christ in his letter greetings like Paul does, but Matthew doesn't use it, John doesn't use it, and we don't see it used anywhere as a formal category. And as, I, as we saw earlier in 1 Thessalonians 2, that same term, apostles of Christ, was also used to refer to Silvanus and Timothy and Paul, none of whom were part of the Twelve, and two of which most cessationists don't even want to recognize as apostles at all. Jude also does have a reference to words spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. This seems to be alluding to the Twelve, but he's using it informally, and there aren't any other important references to apostles of Christ in the Scripture. It's not used consistently. It's not used as a category, as a special group. Now again, there is one special group of apostles in Scripture. It's the Twelve. And this is how they were designated, as, quote, the Twelve. You can find lots of references to this in Scripture. For example, Mark 14.20, John 6.70, Acts 6.2, 1 Corinthians 15.5, and other places. But Paul was not a part of this group, ever. There is no special group for the Twelve plus Paul. It just doesn't exist. And the only way to make apostles of Christ that group the way that Waldron and other cessationists do, is to impose a preconceived viewpoint onto the text. So, what about the other phrase, apostles of the churches? Is there some systematic way that that terminology is being used? Well, there's only two passages in the New Testament that refer to apostles like this, so let's just read them both. 2 Corinthians 8, 23, As for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives, that's the Greek plural apostoloi, of the churches, and an honor to Christ. And then there's Philippians 2.25. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, that's Greek singular apostolos, whom you sent to take care of my needs. So in both of these cases, the translators chose English words. You'll notice that. Neither of these passages translate apostolos as apostle. In almost every English translation, they translate it with words like messenger or representative, because the context in both cases seems to indicate that Paul is using that word apostle in these specific passages in a very obviously generic way. And again, you have to remember that the word apostle was a pretty common word in Paul's day. Jesus used it in a highly specific way 
And that was adopted for the most part by the early church and used like that. But the word was still a common word. And so it's not surprising to see that it was sometimes employed in this more informal sense. But again, it's quite obvious that the word is being used generically in both of these passages. Why? Because in both cases, Paul specifically qualifies the word with the genitive noun to identify these apostles or representatives with a local church rather than with Christ directly. So we can easily concede that the term apostles of the churches in these two passages does indeed refer to generic messengers. The term is not being used, however, for post-ascension apostles like Paul and Barnabas and Adronicus and Junius. It's also not being used for Ephesians 4.11 apostles. It's only being used in reference to those two very specific situations. And it's frankly absurd that cessationists try to place every apostle mentioned in Scripture besides the 12 plus Paul into this generic category. The only way you could possibly arrive at that conclusion is by begging the question. Okay, so it seems pretty clear to me that there's no systematic way in which the Scriptures use the term apostles of Christ and apostles of the churches to distinguish what they call big A apostles from small A apostles. And remember, the wrench in the machine here is Paul. Because if Paul weren't in the equation, it would be so much easier to make a case that the 12 were the only real apostles. But every Bible-believing Christian has to admit that Paul was just as much an apostle as Peter or John or any of the 12. And as I mentioned earlier, that seems to open the floodgates for realizing that there were quite a few people in the early church that were recognized as apostles like Paul. And that creates a real problem for cessationists. So here's the most common way they respond to this dilemma. They have created a list of requirements that all true apostles had to meet. And this list, they feel, will effectively limit the apostolate to the 12 plus Paul and probably James. Here's what Waldron says. In the New Testament, there are at least three indispensable characteristics of an apostle of Christ, the big A apostle. These characteristics were unique and limited to only a few men. They are further proof of the distinction between big A and small A apostles. So here's the requirements for big A apostles, according to cessationists. These are the ones that I'm getting directly from Waldron's book. There's three of them. Number one, apostles of Christ had to be eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. Number two, apostles of Christ had to be appointed directly by Jesus himself. And finally, apostles of Christ needed to have miraculous signs. In Waldron's own words, quote, only someone with each of these characteristics could claim to be an apostle of Christ. Two out of the three were not sufficient. Every apostle of Christ must first have physically seen the resurrected Lord. Second, must have been appointed directly by Christ. And third, must have performed miraculous signs to vindicate himself as an apostle of Christ, end quote. And so by setting these three requirements, cessationists feel that they have adequately barred anyone today from being an apostle of Christ beyond the 12 plus Paul. But hold on, not so fast. There is a really, really big problem with this. Actually, there's two pretty big problems, but one is so glaring. I'm just astonished that cessationists don't see it. First, these three requirements are essentially contrived. In other words, they aren't explicitly listed anywhere in Scripture as requirements for apostles of Christ, much less as requirements for apostles, as we're going to see below. But second, even if we accept them for the sake of argument, if you look at the passages from which these requirements are derived, often they actually exclude Paul rather than including him. For example, you know, the, the first point, apostles of Christ had to be eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. Waldron gives three scriptures in his book to prove this, and guess what? Paul himself strikes out on two of the three. Let me show you. The first one is Acts 1.22, which says, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, it's odd to me that Waldron quotes verse 22 in isolation because it's literally only half a sentence. And sometimes this doesn't make such a big difference, but in this case, you really need to get the context. It's kind of important. Remember, this is after Jesus had ascended to heaven. Of course, Judas had hanged himself, leaving only 11 disciples. And so Peter suggested that they should replace Judas. And now, let me read that passage again in context with the previous verse. Peter is speaking and he says, So one of the men who have accompanied us, meaning the disciples, during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. You see what Peter's saying here? They're discussing the requirement for the person who would take the place of Judas in that special group of 12 apostles. This is not a requirement for all apostles. Let me just reiterate this. What we are reading here is not a requirement for apostles. It's a requirement for the one who would become the replacement of Judas and become one of the 12 apostles. 
Why do cessationists always say this is a requirement for apostles? It wasn't. Was Paul an apostle? Of course. And you might say, well, yeah, of course, Paul saw the resurrected Christ, so he fulfilled that requirement. No, he didn't. The scripture didn't say that it's a requirement of apostles to see the resurrected Christ. What it says is that the one who would replace Judas had to have been with Jesus throughout his entire earthly ministry, beginning from the moment that he was baptized by John until the moment he ascended into heaven. In other words, Paul completely misses the cut on this requirement. Paul never met the earthly Jesus. He wasn't with Jesus at the end of his ministry, let alone at the beginning. So this verse actually, actually excludes Paul. So why do cessationists use it to prove that Paul is a big A apostle of Christ? The second verse is Acts 10, 39 through 41. And for context here, this is Peter talking again. This time he's preaching at the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile centurion that God sent Peter to. And this is part of Peter's gospel presentation at the house of Cornelius. And he says, we are witnesses of all the things that he, that's Jesus, did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Okay, so who's Peter talking about here? Who are those witnesses chosen beforehand by God who ate and drank with Jesus after he rose from the dead? Was Paul one of those? Absolutely not. Paul never ate and drank with Jesus during that time between the resurrection and the ascension. He wasn't even a believer yet. This is referring specifically to the disciples of Jesus and maybe to some others that fit the bill, but definitely not Paul. So why are they using this verse to prove Paul's apostolic credentials? I have no clue. And then there's one more passage to prove that an apostle of Christ must have seen the resurrected Christ. We find it in 1 Corinthians 9.1, and this is Paul defending his apostleship, and he says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Okay, finally, we have something here that applies to Paul. Yes, Paul saw Jesus. When? Well, it seems apparent that he's making a reference to the encounter that he had on the road to Damascus. At least that's the typical interpretation. And even if there was some other experience that Paul's talking about here, one thing is certain, any encounter Paul had with Christ was post-ascension. So cessationists take this verse where Paul says that he saw the Lord. Then they combine it with the verses that talk about being with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry until the end, and the verse about eating and drinking with him after the resurrection. And it's on that basis that they say that one requirement for being an apostle is to have been an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. But then they even take it a step further because they claim that Paul's post-ascension witness of the resurrected Christ was something singular. Let me read this here. Waldron says, quote, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, Paul makes it very clear that he is claiming the same kind of appearance to himself that the original apostles received, end quote. Now, I'll talk more about 1 Corinthians 15 in a while, but let me just say for now, briefly, I'm not so sure about this. 1 Corinthians 15 is not a passage in which Paul is making a case for his apostolic credentials. It's not about requirements for apostles at all. It's a passage in which Paul is refuting those who say that there's no resurrection. And that's what it's about. It's about the resurrection. Paul's argument is that if the dead aren't raised, then that means Jesus wasn't raised either. But here's a bunch of people that saw Jesus raised, and I'm one of those guys. To turn this passage into some kind of an apostolic litmus test is very odd, unless you have an agenda, which these cessationists obviously do. Now, in 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord, I would agree that here Paul is pointing to his witness of the resurrection of Christ as evidence of his apostleship. But he's not saying that he's the only one who could ever have this experience, and I don't see how it convincingly places Paul into a closed group of big A apostles, especially in light of the other passages we read that clearly exclude him. Now again, I'm not saying that Paul isn't special. I'm just saying that these verses don't prove what the cessationists think they prove. Now I'm going to show you in a moment that Paul is special, and Paul is in a special category. But for now, we just need to look at these cessationist arguments at face value and see if they have any substance, and so far, there's none. Okay, the second requirement for apostles of Christ, according to Waldron and most cessationists, is that Jesus himself must appoint them. And Waldron supports this claim by citing the gospel passages where Jesus specifically chose his 12 apostles, like Mark 3.14, Luke 6.13, Acts 1.2, Acts 10.41, and where Paul makes his apostolic appointment clear. For example, in Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul begins the letter by saying, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. In other words, cessationists are pointing here 
to the fact that Jesus appointed Paul an apostle rather than any man. My response to this would be, I suppose, amen, I agree. Only Jesus can appoint his own apostles. What I fail to see is how that restricts anyone today from being an apostle. It actually appears to do the opposite. The original 12, including Judas, were chosen by the Lord in a very unique way. He like physically tapped them on the shoulder and said, follow me. All right, so those original 12 men are the only ones that were ever chosen like that. Not even Matthias, who replaced Judas, was chosen like that. And Matthias was actually one of the 12. His name is actually inscribed on the foundations of the New Jerusalem. And Matthias was chosen by casting lots. Now listen, we can argue about whether or not Paul was called in a way that can't be replicated today. But you definitely can't argue that we can't cast lots today. If Matthias, who was one of the actual 12 apostles, was chosen by casting lots, how can cessationists use this as a requirement for apostles that you have to have been chosen in a special way by the Lord? And how can they do it in such a way that it includes Paul and excludes everybody else? You see, there's so much wrong with this. It's hard to even get a grip on it. But here, here's the issue. First, yes, Jesus chose his original 12 apostles in a very unique way. But we're talking about the 12, not about all apostles. Second, even Matthias, who was one of the 12, was not chosen in that unique way. Third, Paul was not chosen in that unique way either, and yet cessationists claim that he was because of his Damascus Road experience. But he never claimed that his Damascus Road experience put him in the same category as the 12. And it's not obvious why the Lord couldn't call someone today in the same way that he called Paul. And finally, the scripture just doesn't say that apostles have to be sent by the Lord in some specific way. That Jesus has to appoint his apostles, that's a given. How he does that is a completely open question. How did he call James? How did he call Silvanus and Timothy? How did he call Andronicus and Junius? We don't know. What difference does it make? As long as he called them to be apostles, they were. Now, Barnabas is an interesting case because in Acts, we see that Barnabas and Saul, later called Paul, were listed as prophets and teachers at first. That was in Antioch. There was no mention of any apostles. And then the Holy Spirit spoke and sent them on a mission. And then from that point on, they are known as apostles. So it seems like they were called by the Holy Spirit, sending them on a mission. I see no reason why that very thing couldn't happen right now today. In any case, nothing in Scripture indicates that Paul was chosen in a way that others, even beyond the apostolic age, could not be. And again, at the risk of being redundant, I want to clarify, I'm not saying that apostles today are on the same level as Paul. I'm just saying, I'm pointing out what has to be acknowledged from an honest reading of these texts. They themselves don't put Paul into a special category of apostles with the original 12. Okay, and then there's one final requirement that apostles of Christ must have miraculous signs. And the case for this requirement is made by recognizing a couple of things. Well, first, obviously the apostles' ministries were marked by miracles, but even more to the point, Paul said this of his own ministry among the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs, wonders, and miracles. So yes, Paul certainly had miracles in his ministry, and those miracles were obviously taken as a sign of his apostolic calling. But again, this in and of itself does nothing to put Paul into a closed category. In fact, it does the opposite. The only reason that someone would believe that miracles put Paul in a closed category is if they're a cessationist. And all that proves is that one bad idea leads to another. And I don't have time to get into that right now, but suffice it to say, that none of these three requirements, in and of themselves, effectively place Paul into the same category as the original 12. Paul was not one of the 12 apostles. And yet, he was an apostle in the fullest sense of the word. And it's not because he was with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. He wasn't. It's not because he saw the Lord in a way that no one else could ever experience. He didn't. And it's not because Paul's miracles were more extraordinary than anyone else. Paul was an apostle because the Lord called him to be an apostle. He answered that call, and he did that apostolic work, period. Now, obviously, at this point, we probably need to return to the issue of inspiration because, you see, cessationists need Paul to be in that special category of apostles because Paul wrote Scripture. And their thinking goes like this. If Paul didn't belong to a special closed group of apostles, then it's possible that someone today could claim to be an apostle on that same level and then write new Scripture. Here's how Thomas Schreiner puts it. Quote, we don't have apostles like Paul and Peter and John anymore. They gave us the authoritative teaching by which the church continues to live to this day, and that is the only teaching we will need until Jesus returns. We know that new apostles won't appear since Paul specifically says he was the last apostle, 1 Corinthians 15.8. And when James, the brother of John, died, Acts 12.2, he wasn't replaced. 
Apostles, in the technical sense, are restricted to those who have seen the risen Lord and have been commissioned by him. And no one since apostolic times fits such criteria. The apostles were uniquely appointed for the early days of the church to establish orthodox doctrine. There is no warrant then for saying there are still apostles today. Indeed, if anyone claims to be an apostle today, we should be concerned. For such a claim opens the door to false teaching and to abuse of authority, end quote. All right, let's just consider these points in turn. Did Paul really say that he was the last apostle? Absolutely not. And I just want to emphasize this while we're on the subject because I've heard so many cessationists use this line. Where do they get this idea? Well, it comes from something that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I've already mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, but let's look at it a little bit closer. As I mentioned, in this chapter, Paul is refuting people that say there's no resurrection from the dead. And he's using a technique here called reductio ad absurdum, or reduction to absurdity, which is basically a technique where you take an argument to its logical conclusion, and you show, ultimately, if you take a particular line of reasoning to its ultimate conclusion, it's going to take you somewhere you don't want to go. So Paul is saying to those that teach that there's no resurrection, that if they're right, and there is no resurrection, that means that even Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then basically nothing else matters anyway. But first, before he launches into that argument, he sets it up by providing a list of people who are witnesses of the resurrection. All right, so that's part of his argument against people that say there's no resurrection is a bunch of us saw him resurrected. And this is what he says, starting in verse 5. And that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So in context, it's very obvious what Paul is saying. He's not saying that he's the last person Jesus ever appeared to or would ever appear to. Paul is just saying that he's the last one in this specific list to whom Jesus appeared. We know for a fact that Jesus appeared to others after this. He appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos, for example. And remember, this passage is not about what qualifies someone to be an apostle. Paul isn't putting himself in this list to prove his apostolic credentials or something like that. What Paul is doing here is giving convincing evidence that Jesus rose from the dead because of all the people who are eyewitnesses of that fact. And Paul is saying, hey, even, even I'm an eyewitness. Even though I wasn't a believer at that time, I wasn't even saved for years later. I was really late to the party compared to those other folks, but I saw him too. That's all he's saying. He never says that he was the last one to see the Lord in history, much less that he was the last apostle. How someone educated, like Schreiner, can say that Paul specifically says that he was the last apostle is beyond me. It's a lie. Again, Paul isn't even saying that he's the last apostle Jesus appeared to, much less that he's the last apostle ever. It's really unbelievable. And honestly, it just shows how far some of these guys are, are willing to go to twist the Bible to support their agenda. Let's look at another point. Schreiner says that after the apostle James, the son of Zebedee, died, he wasn't replaced. Well, that's true, but what does that prove? Only that no other apostle would join the Twelve. Paul wasn't one of the Twelve, and yet he was an apostle. Now, if Schreiner's trying to use the fact that no one was appointed in the place of James after he died as an argument against the idea of apostolic succession, then he would have a point. But if he's using this to prove that there's no apostles after the Twelve, he's just mistaken. This is a category error, again. And so, given the many misunderstandings and questionable assumptions in Schreiner's premise, it's no wonder that his conclusion is also wrong. He says, if the gift of apostleship has ended, then other gifts may have ended as well, end quote. My friends, nowhere does the Bible say or even imply that the gift of apostleship has ended, nor does it say that any of the other gifts have ended either, not a single one. As poor of an argument as this is, I find it surprisingly common in cessation of circles. Here's a similar argument by Tom Pennington, who said, quote, It's also significant, I think, that the gift of apostleship ceased without a crystal clear New Testament statement that it would. That means it is neither impossible nor is it unlikely that other significant changes happened with the passing of the apostles as well. You see, once you agree that there are no apostles today at the same level as Peter and Paul, then you have admitted that there was a major change in the gifting of the Spirit between the apostolic and post-apostolic age. In fact, the one New Testament gift most frequently connected to miracles, the gift of apostleship, ceased, end quote. <laughs> Guys, this is just so painfully sloppy. Each one of these deductions is just wrong. And I want to show you, like I promised I would do at the beginning of this podcast, where this horrific logic leads. Because he's using this claim that there are no more apostles to make a cessationist argument against the continuation of other gifts, including the gifts of the Spirit. So he's saying, yeah, I know that the Bible never says that any of the gifts of the Spirit, like tongues or prophecy, have ceased. 
But it also doesn't say that the gift of apostleship would cease. But since we know that it did, or we assume that it did, we can go ahead and assume that other gifts have ceased as well. You know, it's difficult to overstate how irrational and dangerous an approach like this is. He's basically admitting that his premise is unbiblical, and then he's asking us to accept it anyway because it supports a conclusion that he wants you to believe. And this is a guy who considers himself a theologian. And keep in mind, especially with Tom Pennington and his ilk, that these are the same guys that are so quick to call out everybody that they don't agree with as a heretic. Let me tell you something. This kind of exegesis is the stuff of heresy. And let's just hope that this isn't representative of the kind of hermeneutic these guys approach the rest of Scripture with, or I'd say that their theology is undoubtedly riddled with grave and fatal false doctrines and errors. Because you can't force the Scriptures to affirm your biases. That's an extremely dangerous precedent to set. And I want to caution cessations here with a matter that touches the heart of what they've expressed as their primary concern. Cessationists reject modern apostles and prophets and miracles and prophecy and even tongues because they say that these gifts are a threat to the closed canon of Scripture. But isn't the precedent that they're setting here of rejecting clear New Testament teaching on the basis of extra-biblical presuppositions, isn't that the real threat to the integrity of Scripture? If deductions like the one Tom Pennington made here constitute a valid hermeneutic, then everything in Scripture is just strictly subjective. And Scripture itself is nothing more than a blunt tool to be used to reinforce our personal opinions. So let me just return to my chart here for a moment and reiterate what cessationists have done with these arguments. They've reduced apostles to two categories. You have apostles of Christ or big A apostles and apostles of the churches or small A apostles. Everyone, both in the New Testament and in history, who would be an apostle has to go into one of these two categories. They're either on the same level as the 12, or they're nothing more than an apostle of the churches, which, let's just be honest, if you're an apostle of the churches, you might as well be an apostle of Fuddruckers or Baskin Robbins. You're not a real apostle. That's just all there is to it. Remember, Waldron said, quote, a representative sent to a meeting of an association of churches is another example of an apostle of that church. But come on, some delegate sent to a denominational conference is not what anyone means when they use the word apostle. And that's just what this bottom category is. It's just generic messengers. And so, again, you're either on the same level as Peter and the Twelve, or you're nothing but a conference delegate. There's no in-between. What happened to that whole middle category of fivefold ministry gift apostles that we read about in Ephesians 4? Why have cessationists ignored this? What do they do with it? Well, let's look now at Ephesians 4 in a little bit more depth, along with another passage found in Ephesians 2. So Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13 says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then the next passage is Ephesians 2. We're going to read 19 through 22. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. One cessationist author by the name of Nancy Almodovar gives us the cessationist interpretation of these passages. She says, quote, those who claim apostolic authority today are attempting to rebuild the foundation that has already been laid and built. In Ephesians 4, Paul writes, and he gave himself some to be apostles and prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. There is within that verse a finality of the office. It does not say that God continually gives, but that he gave, which is past tense. Because there is no distinction in this passage as to which gift is continual and which is not, it must be read in view of Ephesians 2.20, where Paul delineates that the apostles and prophets are the foundation. No builder ever places a foundation a second time in a building. Foundations are once for all tasks. Pastors and teachers continue because they are not foundational offices, but instead are leaders and rulers over the congregations after the apostles were gone, but the foundation does not need to be relayed. End quote. Okay, first, let's just address the fact that Ephesians 4.11 says that Jesus gave the gifts in the past tense. Is this passage saying that the ministry gifts are limited to the past? If so, we would have to deal with a major exegetical problem. Notice that he gave not only apostles and prophets, but pastors, teachers, and evangelists as well. They're all in the same tense. It doesn't say he gave apostles and prophets, but he continues to give pastors and teachers. John Ruthven says this brilliantly. He says, quote, the implication 
of the Ephesian metaphor for cessationism hangs on the use of he gave, Edoke and Arist, in verse 11. Was this a singular punctiliar act, as some would say the Arist tense implies? If so, this would argue for the uniqueness and cessation of apostles and prophets, but it would also require the cessation of the other categories of ministry, evangelists and pastor teachers, since they are all placed in parallel construction and are characterized by the accusative plural endings. If the giving of these gifted people to the church is an ongoing process, then similarly, there's no exegetical warrant for artificially dividing these ministries into categories of extraordinary and ordinary, suggesting that one group is no longer given by the victorious Lord, but that the other continues. Exegetically, the gifts continue or cease as a single group, end quote. And so again, if you're going to say that apostles and prophets don't exist anymore because Ephesians 4.11 is past tense, then you also have to be willing to give up pastors, teachers, and evangelists and say that all these gifts are gone. Now, basically everything's gone. On the flip side, if you're going to say that we still have pastors, teachers, and evangelists, you have to be willing to accept the ongoing role of apostles and prophets as well. As Ruthven said, exegetically, the gifts continue or cease as a single group. But even more to the point, there's no reason for us to reject any of these gifts on the basis of the verb tense. You know, D.A. Carson, who is a very well-known New Testament scholar, addressed this very issue in a book called Exegetical Fallacies. Remember there was that cessationist author I quoted earlier who said that when Ephesians 4.11 says that Christ himself gave apostles and prophets, she said that because this is in the past tense, it indicates a, quote, finality of the office. But in this book, Carson explains that the aorist tense does not necessarily indicate that something happened in the past once for all. Actually, the aorist tense by itself can indicate one of several different possibilities for a verb's past action. It can refer to an event that happened in the past but still persists, um, an event that ended at some point in the past or generally happened in the past with no reference to whether it continues or not. You have to have the context to determine that. So, for example, in Romans 5, 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. So, obviously, the word sinned there is past tense in English. It's the aorist tense in Greek. So does that mean that all sin happened in the past? Is sin a past once for all completed action? Obviously not. Even in English, although it's in the past tense, when we see the context, we understand exactly what it's trying to say. Even a basic English dictionary defines the aorist as, quote, an unqualified past tense of a verb without reference to duration or completion of the action, end quote. That's from the new Oxford American Dictionary, by the way. So again, we can interpret the way that an aorist verb is used without context. And to use it as evidence that any of the gifts in Ephesians 4 were both given and discontinued in the past is to betray just a basic misunderstanding of biblical Greek. Listen to this excerpt from Exegetical Fallacies. Quote, more than two decades ago, Frank Stagg wrote an article about the abused aorist. The problem, as he saw it, was that competent scholars were deducing from the presence of an aorist verb that the action in question was once for all or completed, and the problem arises in part because the aorist is often described as the punctiliar tense. Careful grammarians, of course, operating within traditional categories, understood and explained that this does not mean the aorist could be used only for point actions. The aorist, after all, is well-named. It is aorist, without place, undefined. It simply refers to the action itself without specifying whether the action is unique, repeated, ingressive, instantaneous, past, or accomplished. The best grammarians understood this well and used the term punctiliar in much the same way a mathematician uses the term point in geometry to refer to a location without magnitude. But just as the mathematical notion is not intuitively obvious, so also has the notion of punctiliar action been a stumbling block to many interpreters. End quote. And among those interpreters who seem to be constantly stumbling over this notion, we find our beloved cessationists who keep insisting that when Ephesians 4.11 says that Christ gave apostles and prophets, pastor, teachers, and evangelists, it means that apostles and prophets were only given in the past and are no longer relevant. That's just bad exegesis. Not to mention the fact that, as I already mentioned, the passage itself puts apostles and prophets in the same category as pastor, teachers, and evangelists, using the same tense, voice, mood, person, and number for all five. So how can they cut apostles and prophets out and say, these ones are obsolete, while holding on to the rest and saying, these ones continue today. Well, believe it or not, they do have a method. And Nancy Almodovar gives us that method in that quote that we read earlier. Remember, she said, referring to Ephesians 4.11, quote, because there is no distinction in this passage as to which office is continual and which is not, it must be read in view of Ephesians 2.20, where Paul delineates that the apostles and prophets are the foundation. No builder ever places a foundation a second time in a building. Foundations are once for all tasks. 
Pastors and teachers continue because they are not foundational offices, but instead are leaders and rulers over the congregations after the apostles were gone. But the foundation does not need to be relayed, end quote. So first, I want you to notice what she's doing. She says, quote, because there is no distinction in this passage as to which office is continual and which is not, it must be read in view of Ephesians 2.20, end quote. Do you see that? She's starting out with the assumption that some of these gifts are continual and others aren't. Where does she get that idea? It's not in the text. The text says nothing about some of the gifts being only for the first century and others continuing to be relevant. She's starting out with an extra biblical presupposition and then reading that back into the text. That's not the right way to do biblical exegesis, folks. If that's the way you're going to interpret Scripture, you can make the Bible say almost anything that you want it to. So how is she going to pull off this little stunt of getting the passage to say something that it doesn't say and it was never meant to say? Well, she says we have to interpret Ephesians 4.11 in light of Ephesians 2.20, which says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And then Nancy says, quote, no builder ever places a foundation a second time in a building. Foundations are once for all tasks. Pastors and teachers continue because they are not foundational offices, but instead they're leaders and rulers over the congregations after the apostles were gone. But the foundation does not need to be relayed, end quote. But here's why this doesn't work. Ephesians 4.11 and Ephesians 2.20 are talking about two totally different things. In Ephesians 4.11, Paul is talking about ministry gifts that Jesus gave and continues to give to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ can be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And remember, Paul lists all these gifts together in parallel construction, making them exegetically inseparable. But in Ephesians 2.20, Paul is speaking specifically about the historical founding of the church of Jesus Christ. And yes, the historical establishment of the church is indeed a one-time event, just like the ascension was. And yes, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. There will never be another Jesus. No one's ever going to die on the cross for our sins again. And the original 12 apostles are the foundation. There's never going to be another group of men hand-selected by the Lord to be eyewitnesses of his life and death and resurrection and ascension. Yes, that's all in the past. That's the heart of our faith. It will never be repeated again. It's the foundation upon which everything else in Christianity rests. But that does not mean that there are no other apostles after the 12. It doesn't mean that we don't need apostles today to equip God's people for works of service, to build up the body of Christ. That function of apostles and prophets, pastor, teachers, and evangelists is still needed, according to Ephesians 4, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You know, I feel like at its core, this debate often really just boils down to an attempt to force the Bible to delineate categories that it just simply doesn't. You know, it's a very modern Western way of thinking to look for precise terms and technical definitions and rigid categories that don't overlap. But listen, the Bible wasn't written by a Western theologian. It's not a theology textbook. Sometimes it's just a lot less technical and deductive and precise than we would like it to be. And sometimes it requires us to be less technical and to use common sense. I'll give you an example of this. I've used this in classroom settings in the past. It's a little bit of a different subject, but I think it illustrates the point well. In John 7, 38, Jesus refers to rivers of living water that he said would flow out from those who believe in him. And in the next verse, John explains what Jesus meant by that. He says that Jesus was speaking about the Spirit whom those who believed were going to receive later. He says, up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And in fact, a more literal thing of the Greek would simply be that the Spirit was not yet. But could John mean that the Spirit did not yet exist? Of course not. Could he even mean that the Spirit had not been given? No, he couldn't mean that either because there are many scriptures in the Old Testament that show the Spirit of God coming upon, resting upon, dwelling among, inspiring, leading, moving, filling, and so on people all throughout the Old Testament. Come into the New Testament, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And of course, we know that the Spirit was resting on Jesus himself. So how can John say that the Spirit had not yet been given or was not yet? Well, obviously, John expects his readers to use a little bit of common sense. He's not talking about the Spirit not being given in any way. He was speaking about a specific sense in which the Spirit had not been given. But this kind of thinking drives Westerners crazy because we are often looking for these precise theological definitions and these technical categories where the scriptures don't 
overlap and where the definitions don't overlap. And sometimes the Bible just doesn't mean to give us these technical categories. So often what happens is, instead of just using common sense, instead of just trusting other people to do the same, our systematic theologians come along and they decide that they are going to clean up the confusion by creating these extra biblical definitions and categories that they think will solve the problem and often just make the problem worse. And that's exactly what I think has happened here with this debate around apostles. You don't find big A and little a categories of apostles in scripture. You just don't find it. There's not these neat, clean, non-overlapping categories of apostles. What you see is this. There were 12 apostles who were a unique category. Paul was not one of the 12, but his writings were just as authoritative, and they're in our Bibles. And in a couple of isolated cases, people were called apostles, but the word is obviously being used in a generic way. And there were lots of other apostles mentioned in the New Testament that are never relegated to any inferior categories, even though they weren't on the same level as the 12. And today we don't see them on the same level as Paul, but Paul probably would have seen them as equals. Yeah, that's sloppy. It's messy, but it's true. And this is the kind of stuff that gives systematic theologians ulcers. But you can't add your own opinions to the Bible, even if it would be convenient to do so. And so, let me just put a bit of a fine point on this. Let's just return to this chart for a minute. And let me summarize a lot of what we've discussed today. And then I want to deal with Paul, who, as I've mentioned, is kind of a wrench in the machine here. I want to show you how I believe Paul fits into this picture. Again, the most important and rare group of apostles is right here at the top, and it's known as the 12. These are obviously the 12 apostles of the Lamb, as they're called in Revelation 21. These men were with Christ from the beginning of his ministry to the end. They were eyewitnesses of the resurrection, all except Matthias, were personally selected by Jesus during his earthly life and commissioned to be his representatives on earth. They all died in the first century. No one else will ever be part of this group. All their surviving writings and teachings are considered canonical and authoritative. Okay, next, we have what I'm calling fivefold apostles. And sometimes I refer to these as Ephesians 4.11 apostles because Ephesians 4.11 is where Paul lists them, along with prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, as gifts given to the church for the purpose of edifying the body and helping to build it up until we reach a state of maturity. This is the category into which I place most people that we would identify as apostles today, as well as most of those that were considered apostles in the New Testament. Now, my understanding, based on the ministry of the Apostle Paul, is that apostles in this category will carry a special grace on their lives to establish the church in foundational ways. So this means that they will often be literal church planters and pioneers. I would expect apostles like this to be working in miracles and operating in the gifts of the Spirit. I think that often profound suffering and even persecution are normal for apostles in this category. And as a result, I think you can often expect to find a certain kind of fruit and a depth of character in their lives that is unusually Christ-like. Also, I think that apostles like this are known by their fruit rather than by their business cards. And just for the record, just because someone calls themselves an apostle doesn't mean they are one. In fact, anyone who really understands what it means to be an apostle like this probably wouldn't want it anyway. And then we have the final category at the bottom of this chart, is what I'm calling generic messengers. Remember, there's two scriptures where the word apostle was used to describe representatives of the churches. And this is because the word apostle, as we talked about earlier, was a common word in the ancient Greco-Roman world. And it was used in a lot of different ways to indicate somebody who was a messenger or sent one. And so in this context, the word apostle just means a generic messenger. But I want to emphasize that this can be somewhat misleading because this just simply isn't what anybody means today when they call themselves an apostle. Nobody who calls himself an apostle today means that they are a generic messenger. And so I'd rather just call this final category of apostles messengers or representatives the way that almost every translation of the New Testament does with those two instances where the word apostoloi or apostolos is used in this generic way. Now you'll notice that I've specified that this top category of apostles has been entrusted with authoritative teaching. That is, Scripture. Now, this can't be said of either of the other categories of apostle. Ephesians 4.11 apostles can't write Scripture. Obviously, generic messengers or apostles of the churches can't write Scripture either. And so far, all of this should be pretty straightforward and honestly, pretty uncontroversial. But here's the caveat. As I mentioned earlier, there's one person who doesn't fit neatly into any category. Actually, there's probably two people. And that's 
obviously the Apostle Paul and probably also James. And here's the issue with these guys. They definitely did not belong in the first category of apostle, and yet we see them as authoritative teachers like the Twelve. In fact, Paul wrote more scripture himself than the other Twelve apostles combined. And so this makes us feel a little bit hesitant to put him into the category of Ephesians 4.11 apostles, and that's completely understandable because if Paul wrote more scripture than anyone else, and if Paul's in a category of apostle that's still open today, how can we be sure that nobody today is going to write scripture? And yet, Paul did do the work of a five-fold apostle. In fact, the only way we can even try to define what a five-fold apostle is and does is by looking at the teaching and the example of Paul. So I would actually say that most of what Paul did in ministry fits into that Ephesians 4.11 category. But obviously, the scripture writing role is a huge exception to the rule. And so for this reason, I think what we have to do is see Paul as filling a category all his own. And let's just be honest and say that it's not because there's some particular scripture that says that Paul is in a category of his own. And honestly, I don't think that Paul would have seen himself in that way. He, I don't think Paul saw himself as being in his own special category either. But it's what we have to do to make sense of the situation. And so, as you can see, I've placed him outside of that vertical continuum, off to the side, between the first two categories of apostles. On the one hand, Paul's work and calling is very similar to other Ephesians 4 apostles. On the other hand, because of the unique place that he had in history, his work and his writings are authoritative and foundational. And not only so, but more importantly, he had the unique opportunity to have direct access to the Twelve. And he's one of the only people outside the Twelve who was recognized by them as carrying authoritative teaching. And as a consequence, Paul's teachings are recognized by the early church as authoritative, and then they're passed down through the generations of Scripture, and then they're canonized, and they make it into our Bibles today. In fact, this is just an interesting side note. If someone asks the question, why can't someone today write Scripture? Before we make this too complicated, let's just back up and think about what the New Testament actually is. The New Testament is not just a collection of books that we think are inspired. It's not even a collection of books that some church council decided were inspired. The New Testament is a collection of books that the church historically believed brought us closest to the teachings of Christ. And that's why the endorsement of the Twelve was so important. The Twelve were the ones who were closest to Jesus. And that makes their endorsement critical, and obviously nobody today can get that endorsement. And so it's simple why no one today can write Scripture. They just can't. It's impossible. It's like asking someone why they can't add lines to Homer's Iliad. It's a silly question. The Bible is a closed historical document, like the Declaration of Independence. And there is a complex historical process through which that canon was settled. So unless you can get access to a time machine, you can't go back to the first century and have your teaching endorsed by the Twelve and then have it affirmed by the early church and then have it passed down through the ages to ultimately be canonized. When you think about it, it's really obvious why someone today can't write Scripture. So this is my simple, common-sense approach to this issue of apostles. And remember, the question we've been trying to answer today in this podcast is whether or not, according to Scripture, there are apostles today. And at this point, it should be pretty obvious. If you're talking about apostles like the Twelve, the answer is no. If you're talking about five-fold apostles like those mentioned in Ephesians 4, the answer is yes. And in many ways, we can look to Paul as an example of this, as an apostle in this category, with the caveat that Paul filled a very special role historically in the founding of the church, and his surviving writings are authoritative. Okay, now let me say one more thing, especially for those of you that consider yourself charismatic or Pentecostal. And we started with Sam Waldron's book. We're going to return to it here at the end of the podcast. And his book is called To Be Continued, Are the Miraculous Gifts for Today? And as you can see from the title and subtitle, this book is obviously an argument for cessationism. And the whole point of his book is to prove that certain gifts of the Spirit, like prophecy, tongues, healing, and so on, have ceased. And remember, cessationists freely admit that the Bible does not say that any of the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. So in light of that, how do they make their case? Well, what Waldron does in this book is interesting. He uses what he calls the cascade argument, and it begins with the premise that there are no apostles of Christ in the earth today. And then he deduces from that premise that if there's no apostles, then there are no prophets, and if no prophets, then no tongue speakers, no miracle workers in the world today. And the logic behind this is so poor and the biblical support is so meager that it's surprising to realize that 
This is not just Waldron's harebrained idea. Remember, this is the same logic that we saw from Tom Pennington earlier, where he said that basically if there are no more apostles, then it's obvious that at least one of the gifts have ceased. And if so, why not assume that other gifts have ceased as well? In fact, most cessationists that I've read employ this rationale to some extent. Virtually all of them consider it an, an important point. And sometimes, as with Waldron, their entire cessationist argument hinges on this issue to some degree or another. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, it may surprise you that even within some continuation of circles, there continues to be some debate about the ongoing relevance of the apostolic gift. For example, the denomination I was raised in, the Assemblies of God, used to have a position paper. I'm not sure if it's still recognized or not. But they took a very cautious stand on the idea of modern apostles and prophets. And I'm not going to say that they rejected these gifts outright because if I remember right, it was kind of a nuanced and diplomatic paper. But they still adopted many of the same cessationist presuppositions that we've talked about in the podcast today. And they use those to make their case. And again, as for the assemblies, in a practical sense, they probably aren't far off my own take on what a modern apostle and prophet would look like because they'd say, you know, if someone were an apostle today, they wouldn't be writing scripture. They'll probably be planting churches and performing signs and wonders and demonstrating other marks of an apostle that Paul taught about. So fine, they're reticent about the idea of people running around with apostle so-and-so on their business card. I'm not a huge fan of that either, and I get it. But we have to be careful because the moment we start adopting these extra-biblical cessationist presuppositions, we allow that first domino to fall. That leads all the way to, as Waldron put it, a cascade. It's a cascade, all right. It's a cascade of bad theology and poor logic that ultimately leads all the way to full-blown cessationism in the end. Once you surrender this high ground and say, yeah, you know, apostles and prophets are a little bit of a messy category and we really don't need them anyway because we have pastors and presbyters and superintendents now that do the same thing and we want to seem educated and theologically orthodox to our evangelical peers and so we're just going to concede this territory and say, yeah, we admit there's no more apostles or prophets anymore. True, the Bible doesn't actually say that, but it's a pretty convenient and harmless concession. Wrong. It's not harmless. It's unbiblical. And the moment you give up any of the gifts, you immediately open the door for full-blown cessationism. Listen to me. It is impossible to make a sound argument for cessationism from Scripture. Listen, my continuation is friends. The Bible simply does not teach cessationism. We have the theological high ground here, without a doubt. But if you give up one gift, like apostles or prophets, by whatever logic you did that, all the others can be taken away from you as well. Period. So I refuse to give one inch on this point. Apostles and prophets are as relevant to us today as pastors, teachers, and evangelists. And this doesn't make me some fringe wacko that belongs to some obscure cult called the NAR. It just makes me a Bible-believing Christian. Okay, this is a pretty long podcast. I think this is going to do it for me today. Of course, I could get into what I think apostles today might look like and do in a practical sense, but that really will take me far into the territory of opinion and speculation, and my opinions aren't any more valuable than anybody else's, so I'll just leave it to much smarter people to tackle those questions. But what I hope I've been able to do today is answer the basic question, do apostles still exist according to Scripture? And I hope that by now you can say with me that the answer to that question is absolutely, positively, beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes. The apostolic gift is still in operation today. It's not a weird, cultish NAR thing. They are a glorious gift given by our victorious Lord to equip his people for works of service, so that the whole body of Christ can be built up until we all reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature and attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Now, again, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, comment. I'll interact with as many of you as I can. Wherever you're watching this or listening to this, please make sure to follow me. There's lots of great material coming your way in the near future, so stay tuned. Once again, my Patreon account is patreon.com slash Daniel Colenda. If you enjoy this content and you want to help support me, I'd be grateful. If not, no worries. I hope you're blessed anyway. Again, thank you for listening. Until next time, this is Daniel Colenda, Off the Record.